from Salt Lake City. Home of the Utes. Great to be back on campus as we start another season of college football on ESPN. This is a student body that is fully fired up. Their school won the conference championship last year. 10-2 Utah takes the field here at Rice-Eccles Stadium. College football primetime presented by Cooper Tires. Texas A&M out of the Big 12 with a lot to prove about their season. Mike Tirico, Lee Corso, Kirk Herbstreit, Jill Arrington back here with you in Salt Lake City. Utah's big buildup from last year because their offense was very tough to stop. It's the coach's system. It's the guy executing it at quarterback. You know, Mike, Utah uses this wide open spread offense. It's very exciting. It's led by a quarterback named Alex Smith. Now, Alex is a mature player. He's a 21-year-old graduate student. He was number two in the nation last year in touchdown to interception ratio, five to one. He averages over 60% of his passes. He's the number two rusher on the team. Yo, Herb Street, this guy is the complete pass package. And if I'm telling you, if Texas A&M doesn't hit him and hit him early, they're in for trouble tonight. And he runs a very complex scheme, oh, so their defense has improved, but we'll see what they can do. Now, let's talk about the quarterback on the other side. Reggie McNeil, three years now of experience being under center for Texas A&M last year struggled only completed 51 percent of his passes there's a lot of talk right now about Reggie McNeil becoming more of a complete quarterback kind of like a Michael Vick how Michael Vick's trying to work on sitting in the pocket you can showing great patience tonight Reggie McNeil wants to show the country that this offense and he have really improved in the offseason and Lee we talked about this this morning he's gonna have a chance and some one-on-one -on -one opportunities to show that patience and hit some big plays downfield against the Utah secondary we mentioned a lot of pressure and focus on A&M for more on that let's Let's go back down to the sidelines and Jill Arrington. Jill? Uh, thanks, Mike. Texas A&M has been known for their wrecking crew defense for over a decade. But last season, that defensive mystique all but disappeared. Take a look at these numbers. These are not the numbers you expect to see for a Texas A&M defense at the bottom of the country in most of the rankings. Now, Coach Friend in the offseason, he has a rededication to getting that defense back to what it was. He's told the team they can't call themselves the wrecking crew. That's something they're going to have to earn. And, Mike, we're going to see some young players eager to do that today. Yeah. A lot of redshirt freshmen, and as a matter of fact, Jill, about a third of this roster has a chance to play in its first Division I game, whether they're high school true freshmen, redshirted freshmen, or junior college players on Dennis Franchoni's team. Weather tonight, there's a chance of a thunderstorm in the forecast. The temperature is in the mid-70s, but it's going to be going down as the night goes on, and that wind is going to turn around and be steady about 12 to 15 miles per hour. It'll go for most of the night from left to right, one bottom corner of the end zone to the top as you watch. The beautiful framing of the Wasatch Mountains in the background. We'll get some great views, not just tonight, but the entire season, our ESPN college football primetime on Thursday nights with SkyCam. Great to have SkyCam. Matter of fact, if you watch primetime football on ESPN, whether it's our game on Thursday nights, Mike and Ron on Saturdays, or our NFL package, which will start a week from Sunday, you'll see SkyCam in all those games. A&M is in white, Utah is in red. The Aggies won the toss, deferred the option to the second half, so Utah will touch it first. Morgan Scali is back deep to take it back, and they were good at doing that last year. Boys, are you ready? Absolutely. Been waiting all summer. We're yeah. ready to go, man. College football's back. Life is good. Yes, that's right. USC Virginia Tech winning our appetite quite well Saturday. Let's see if Utah's for real, if A&M is back. Uh, Pegram set to kick it off, and off we go with college football primetime on Thursday nights. 4,000 feet of elevation. Altitude takes it all the way through the end zone. Touchback. The drive will start for Alex Smith in Utah at the 20. Now, not only is Alex Smith good, he's smart. He graduated in two years. He took all those advanced placement courses in high school, bang up jobs. So he had a lot of credits coming in, worked real hard in the springs and the summers academically. His dad is a high school principal. Education is very important. And when you are running an offense like this, how great is it to have a kid who's in graduate school, even though it's just his junior year in college? Also, captain of the football team. Shows a lot of respect for the rest of the team. There'll be a lot of four receivers and one back. In this case, they open with five wide receivers and no backs. Smith punts. Takes a deep look. It is miscommunication and incomplete. Steve Savoy was breaking deep. A penalty marker is down here on the very first play. Jonte Buell was in coverage. And our officials from the Big 12 here tonight. Looks like a tripping call on Utah here to start things. 
When these teams played last year in College Station, it was Mountain West officials working the game. As is the norm, these intersectional games, the road team brings their officials. Tripping, offense, number 68, half the distance to go, remains first down. And there's something slightly different in college football. If you didn't watch the game on Saturday, we'll hear the numbers for the players who are called for penalties. Chris Kale Miatu there on the flag. On the Bud Light starting laps, Quentin Ganther, new running back. They love him here. Paris Warren, Steve Savoy, and Travis Latondres among those in the pass catching group. There are the five up front. Jesse Boone is in there at center. Look at the rest of the group, and Kale Miatu picked up the flag on that very first play. First and 20. And Smith is stopped for no game by Jackson Appel, the free safety who was a terrific tackler last season for the Aggies. Jill told you they gave up a boatload of yards and points, and they got to shut it down. They think they're going to do it better because of Jason Jack and Red Bryant, Joseph Bryant, two freshmen up front with Jolly and Montgomery. The backers, Justin Warren, Archie McDaniel, Narada Manning, they are improved in the speed department. Second and 20, and the Smith throw is complete to Travis Latondres, and the receiver picks up oh, about 11 yards. With third and a long eight coming up for Utah. And there are those linebackers that we talked about. A lot of speed improvement on defense for AM. And in the secondary, Jackson appels the big one, the free safety number 19. Experience two with Jonte Buell on one corner, Byron Jones on the other. Third down, they need to get to the 30. They do with Steve Savoy up to the races. Steve Savoy might take it all the way. Touchdown, Utah. Caught seven touchdowns last year. The longest pass reception of his career there, 78 yards. Brian Boris and on to add the extra point. Matt Kovakovic, the punter, did a nice job to get it down. And 73 seconds into the season. Any jitters that might have been on the home team's side because of the buildup of the expectations? Now those expectations are a mountain high full of confidence. Steve Savoy takes it for six. So Utah comes right out of the gate. They had first and 20 at their own 10. Three snaps later, Steve Savoy has given the Utes a 7-0 lead. We talk about the fragile confidence of the Texas A&M team. Yep. They gave up so many points at the end of last year. Looks like they're going to get a three and out, a couple of good physical sticks, and boom, as Franchoni's team gives up a 78-yard touchdown. It looked like they, they had caught a break with the penalty, pushed uh, Utah back. They got off, looked like, to a good start to get some of the confidence going. Now we're going to find out what character they're made out of after what happened to them last year. And you know, Utah caught them off guard by going with the no huddle offense, and it confused the Texas A&M defense. Ryan Borson, his kickoff short, very returnable. And he brought down to the 33-yard line by Renuel Green. But send you back to the touchdown as Green was able to pick it up. Well, this is a young defense, and they're so focused on number five, Paris Warren, that they forget about the maybe the most athletic guy, Steve Savoy, who's going to come in right behind it. Watch the linebackers in the secondary right here lock in, right there. Look at him lock in on number five, Paris Warren, opening up a nice window to try to get the ball in there and throw the ball right into the window. Perfect for the first down. And also, let me show you right there the block. He, 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 he didn't freeze it enough, but there's a block by the wideout right over there and knocked the man off where he went all the way. A uh, terrific block by John Madsen, the 6'5 receiver. First down handoff to Courtney Lewis. And the Texas A&M running back gets about three yards. We'll have second and seven coming up. Eric Weddle on the tackle. Here is Reggie McNeil, junior quarterback. He beat number one Oklahoma as a freshman. Didn't have a good sophomore year. Four and eight his record as a starter. And so much of what Texas A&M's confidence offensively will be as the season progresses. It's going to have to do with how number one handles himself. Reggie McNeil used to be number 16 and uh, took number one when it became available this year. 
second and seven. Aggies spread the field with five wide and pick up the first down with Jason Carter, senior out of Caldwell, Texas, who came on towards the end of the season. We mentioned Courtney Lewis in that backfield on the Bud Light starting lineups. Thousand yard runner last year with Murphy Taylor. They like Daquan Mobley, a kid who came in this year to supplement the receiving court. The big story up front for Texas A&M, C66, left part of your screen, Jeff Hangartner. He was the center. They moved him to tackle. It'll help them pass protect a little bit better. The emergence of Chris Yoder, redshirt freshman out of Houston, has made a big difference. Gayla Garza, Steamer, and Jamie Hightower is back on this team this year. Out of the gun, the hand to Lewis after they picked up a first down. It's a Hightower who lost the headgear after a gain of about a yard. Let's show you what Utah does on the other side of the ball. Gave up 19 points a game last year. Marquez Ledbetter, Boua, Fafita, Fanene. Glad he said that. Right, nice job, like you know, Toon Hackenbrook was a good hard-nosed middle linebacker, and Corey Dodds are the backers. Nagahi on one corner. Morgan Scala, he's the uh, big guy. He's a high school guy from old, maybe a mile from here. Grew up watching Utah football in person. Has become the star of their defense. McNeil keeps it, took it over midfield, and got down to the 48. We're going to have a little third and about four coming up. Lee, give me a feel for this Texas A&M offense. What, what do you want to see from them early on in this game? I want to see exactly what they just did there. I want the ball in the Reggie McNeil's hands. I want the offensive lineman to quit messing around with that pass protection and come out and hit somebody. Texas A&M has got to establish the run first and then go to the passing game if they're going to beat this Utah football team. Four receivers out of the gun. They need to get to the 43-yard line. McNeil's throw is high and incomplete. Ricochet off the hands of the sophomore Urban Taylor. One first down. But now AM will kick it away. We talked about the improvement and how Reggie McNeil is going to try to sit in the pocket. Here's a third and long situation. He's going to feel pressure, sit in there and just make the throw. The receiver's there. He's got to be able to use his eyes, settle down, and make a nice throw there to pick up a first down. The punter is Jacob Young. Not a huge leg, but good at pinning the opponents inside the 20 last year. Special teams always seem to be a factor early in the season. Good hang time here. Fair catch is called for. Receiver Savoy got out of the way and well executed by AM. They back him up inside the 10 at the 6. Nice job by Jacob Young. The kick 42 yards. I mentioned last year these two teams met early in the season, September 6th down at College Station. And hello, it was 21 nothing AM out of the gate. The early run for Terrence Murphy, McNeil to Quinlan, Germany, but Utah had an unbelievable second half. Brett Elliott to John Madsen, the guy who threw the block on that last play, made it a two-point game, and on this play, Elliott couldn't get the two-point conversion, ended up injuring himself for the rest of the season. That's when Alex Smith became the starting quarterback. His first game was here against Cal on a Thursday night on ESPN. And the rest is history. They went on to a 10-2 season and the Mountain West Championship. His own six, a running play that goes nowhere with Marty Johnson. The senior in his seventh year of eligibility was brought down by a Texas A&M senior, Mike Montgomery. You said seventh year, Mike. Explain that to me, please. A lot has happened. Some academic, some injury, some off the field discipline. Mm -hmm. And all together with the injuries that have given him back a couple of years, he ended up getting the seventh year of eligibility. Johnson is back in good stead with his program and academically. And he's seeing the field. And boy, is this kid hungry. Into pass protect for Smith. Another long ball. Another man open. Almost had Savoy for another long one. <laughs> Texas AM might have some issues in the back end right now. Well, what's happened is. Utah obviously is spreading them out. They're getting some one-on-one -on -one opportunities, and it's going to eventually, it already has caught up to them. We're just starting this football game, and it's going to continue to catch up to them. If Alex Smith has time to throw, he's going to make this throw nine times out of ten. What happened here is the receiver easily got off man-to-man -man coverage. Look at that. He just stepped to the inside. Melvin Bullitt did yeah. not keep his back straight, come back, come back. He turned his body. Once he turned his body, it was all over. Bad fundamentals right there by Melvin Bullitt. Third and a dozen. They need to get out to the 16, and Smith will run with it. 
and only get to the eight yard line. So the Aggies defense will get him off the field this time. Three and out. Jason Jack, the redshirt freshman, helped make the play. And I mentioned redshirt freshmen, talked about their youth early. These guys, a lot is being expected of them, and they've never done it before. They don't know what's really going to happen once they get hit in the mouth in a football game on the road. All I can tell you is you look at this defensive line of Texas a this year compared to last year, it's like watching a different team. Just Mac physically. Mac Dubovich, Kirk gets it away quickly. Terrence Murphy awaits back in zone 46. A dangerous punt returner with the fair catch. Smith has a touchdown and a three and out on the offensive side. Texas A&M has good field position when we come back to Salt Lake City. Back here in Salt Lake City, Rice Eccles Stadium was the star of this opening ceremony stadium for the 2002 Olympics here in Salt Lake City. And the beauty of this building is not only is it used by the University of Utah, but you come in here and there's so many memories, including the 1980 Olympic hockey team lighting the cauldron before the 02 games here in Salt Lake City. 7 nothing Utah on top. Where the cauldron burned for those two plus weeks of the Olympic Games two and a half years ago. McNeil, little freeze option. The blitz came. He eluded one man. Now has an open receiver in and out of the hands of Terrence Murphy. That could have been a big play. It was Kavika Casco who came in, thought he had the quarterback dead to rights. Almost became a big play on the other end. Well, they came with a blitz there, and obviously Reggie McNeil has tremendous athletic ability. Little option down off the line, avoids the rush, still has that ability. Now he looks downfield, and you know, last year Terrence Murphy, as good as he is, he had opportunities to come up with big catches. This time he does a nice job of breaking out into the open field. He just has to hold on to the football there. Two defenders were there, one safety coming on the blitz. But Murphy ended up so open. Yep. Jesse Woods is coming the game at receiver. It's put into the belly of Daquan Mobley. Nice job by Mobley to take it across midfield. One third, about five coming up for Texas a &M. Advantages each side. Let's look at the Under Armour advantage for tonight's game, guys. Psychologically, NM has to have this ball game. They've got redemption of last year on their side, plus that word I love, urgency, and they're losing 7 nothing. Not good. If you pour out urgency and redemption yeah. in the Ooh. first five minutes of the first game, that's serious for Texas A&M, and after they're down 7 nothing, momentum, and it's carried on even more with that early touchdown and with this crowd and with what kind of year they had last year. You're right, psychologically, this is going to be an interesting game to watch. See the yellow line where they need to get to for the first down. McNeil keeping. They have Mount Number from a blocking standpoint. And allows McNeil to get the first down inside the 40 to the 39-yard line. Good block by Jamie Hightower and uh, Dominique Steamer. 10-yard game. And that time, we, they, Aldo de, de La Garza pulled the right guard, pulled around to the left. Get the ball into Reggie McNeil's hands any way you can. I still say it, and I'll say it again. If Texas a and going to win this football game, they've got to win the ball running the football. De La Garza. There he is. Man up front. Blank belt in jiu-jitsu. Something he did on his own in this offseason. We have movement up front. Looks like the Aggies might back up five. Prior to the snap, ball start, offense, number 88, and Lane's first down. Well, Dennis Franchoni has a history of turning programs around. He's done it in so many places, of course. Uh, to refresh your memory, he had the two seasons at Alabama and then left Alabama to come to Texas A&M. Returning to the Tex state of Texas, he coached TCU to great success prior to Alabama. And back in a zone where he is more comfortable. And recruiting has shown it. Their record wasn't good. Their recruiting class was last year. McNeil feels the pressure. And he could not get enough steam on it. To complete the pass to Terrence Thomas. Job by Reza Williams, a senior out of Fontana, California, coming in for Utah. What do you think is ahead for uh, Franchoni in the Texas A&M turnaround mode, which I don't think many people thought was going to be as big a turnaround as it has turned out to be? I think what happened to Dennis Franchoni in his first year is he had the effects of that that I think RC Slocum and what happened with his staff when it came to recruiting those last couple years that RC was in college station and they, they were depleted last year they didn't have 
the numbers. They didn't have the athletes that they've had there in the past, and now they're in the process of building it back up. Second and 15, 15. Jason Carter has his hands on it. And take it down to 37. Nice pickup of about seven yards for Carter, the senior out of Caldwell, Texas. I want to show you one of Texas A&M's favorite formations right there, and it's called the bunch. What they do is they put everybody in a spot there to either swing the guy they've got two new places Kirk and Mike where they're going to reverse play off of that I think that's a nice little trick play that they got but watch the reverse off of that that they put in could be very good that's called the bunch formation yeah, and as much man to man as Utah is playing he could come up with a bunch of different routes off of that formation third down need to get beyond the third little screen not enough air under the ball Lewis couldn't get to it and it's fourth down long field goal attempt from here likely won't come from AM. their kicker just doesn't have the leg to make it from this far just in early going in this football game but you can tell all this talk about Reggie McNeil and he's going to settle down he's going to sit in the pocket he's not been able to find his groove up to this point he's, he, I don't know if he needs to get hit I don't know if he needs to come up with a nice throw. Some quarterbacks are different, but something has to happen for Reggie McNeil to find his rhythm. Not second guessing, first guessing. I don't like this call. I'd rather punt the ball back down there and play good field position early in the ball game. That's my opinion. Fourth down, no backs. Franchoni trying to get a timeout call. He did not, and a marker came down. You know, this year in college football, the head coach can call timeout. Dennis was not close enough to the line judge to get the timeout. Let's see what the flag is. Prior to the snap, ball start, offense, five yard penalty, still fourth down. Usually a false start and fourth down is a bad penalty. Oh, that was a good one. It's okay there because he really wanted the timeout. Didn't see something he liked. There's no way he should have went for that fourth down and given up that field position, especially now the second time they played defense. Kirk, they played nice defense when they had good field position back there. The tight end, Joey Thomas, must have had one of those uh, things they use in the NFL, a little microphone in the earpiece. <laughs> he heard the coach yelling time out when it had made the jump. Well, it gives him five more yards so he can yep. kick the ball better. And we saw last time, Jacob Young might not have the strongest leg, but he's good pinning you back inside yeah. the 15 or the 10. go through the end zone for a touchback so the net will only be 23 yards and Texas A&M's defense will have 80 yards to defend well we get to start Labor Day weekend presented by Rustolium epoxy shield we kind of kick the rust off the college football season college game day will be in Baton Rouge and then at night 6 Eastern here on ESPN Oregon State makes the long journey to LSU and then right after that Right down south from here, the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame open against BYU. All on ESPN. For more information, log on to ESPN.com. Both games, like tonight, available in high definition on ESPN HD. Call your cable operator, Direct TV, or Dish Network today. From the 20, Smith hands it. And Marty Johnson able to get three out two the 23-yard line. Well, guys, we talked about the game down south with Notre Dame taking on BYU. So much talked about this Notre Dame season. We're going to reiterate what you guys were saying on SportsCenter before about ended. <laughs> we, don't, we don't agree on this one. I think Notre Dame's going to be lucky to win six ball games. I don't think they have enough game breakers on any side of the ball. They'll win the BYU game, though, offensive line-wise. I think Maurice Stovall, Rima McKnight, I think they have some athletes in place, and now Brady Quinn has experience. I'm looking forward to seeing Oregon State in the Pac-10 come down into LSU and Death Valley and to see if they can deal with that atmosphere. Smith hit as he throws. The tackles missed on Savoy. Gave him more room to get out to the 38. Let's see. He'll mark it down at about the 38-yard line. So a good pickup there. See, we had a flag thrown down there on the sideline out of bounds. See if they've got a holding penalty. Illegal block in the back on the offense. Number 68, the 10-yard penalty from the spot of foul. Repeat second down. Well, Chris Kale out too doesn't really like this new rule of announcing who is penalized because that's two for Chris in the first eight and a half here. Well, he's a great athlete. He was about 10 yards downfield when he committed that penalty. But he's not fast enough to stay with those defensive backs trying to catch a running back. He's 6'4", 338, though. Really nice feet. They think he could be a terrific NFL football player at offensive guard. 
First team all conference preseason out here in the Mountain West. The league won by Utah last year. Quinton Ganther came in motion, the hand up the middle to Marty Johnson. He rumbles to the 32 and will have the first down. Spilled by Jackson Appel, the free safety. There, there's, there, there's as close of old-fashioned football as you're going to see from Utah with all these formations. There's going to spread you out with four or five wide receivers. That time, it was almost like an isolation block. They led one back through and let Marty Johnson see what he could do, and they picked up the first down. It's bizarre that you say old-style football with four and five wides, but <laughs> how would you guys talk about that after this play? The fun offense to play in for these players, that's for sure. Johnson spilling it out to the 39. So Marty Johnson running with purpose here over these couple of plays. Lee, there are principles of old time offense. Single wing, wing T type in this spread offense. When you see the man go in motion, he ends up in a two back position. And it's exactly what Kirk says. One back is leading, the other is sometimes doing a circle route. The reason why I like this, it's called trickery, but it gets down to the basic fundamentals of blocking and tackling. Kirk, the lead play has been there forever, and they do it. There's the bunch formation. They like a lot to the top of your screen. Yep, toss sweep usually out of this. Second and three, Johnson. Trouble with the exchange, but had no trouble getting himself past the yellow line. The first down out to the 43 yard line. So they got receivers going yep. in like 73 different directions, and they're running up the middle for first down. Let me show you the bunch formation. That's the bunch formation right there. And they told me that they had a tendency to run flip play, as Kirk said. So what they did is they put in a little counter play against the tendency of the scouting report. Kirk, I like the way they're moving the football because they got Texas AM off balance now. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with window dressing, different formations different motions they're shifting they're rotating different personnel groups and they're trying to confuse Texas A&M's defense look at this time empty set five wide receivers and now they're going to try to drop back and see if they can hit it and Smith does to Paris Warren that's his big guy took it over midfield with another first down Warren caught 76 balls last year led the Mountain West at seven per game 12 yards there. You see the spread offense now all over college football. Some teams, some teams like to spread the run. Some teams like to spread the throw. Last year, Urban Meyer and Utah had a tendency to run the football a little bit more. This year, they're looking to become more 50-50. They're going to spread you out, but they this year have the ability to stretch the ball down the field to complement Alex Smith's ability to throw the ball. This is great stuff. It hasn't been the same formation or personnel grouping on this drive. John Madsen, tall receiver. Takes it across the 40-yard line. We'll have second and short coming up. And that's when an offensive coordinator feels really good about what's going on. Well, Mike Sanford, the offensive coordinator, is upstairs calling the plays. Again, Mike and Kirk, he sets the bunch to the right. The tendency says he's going that way. Whip back. Quick play to the wideout. Nice play by Mike Sanford. He's calling a good game. And what's great is you have an experienced quarterback in Alex Smith. He's basically looking into the secondary. And if there's a one safety look, he'll go back to that short side like he just did. And if it's a two safety look, he'll go to the field. He's reading the defense on every snap. Tom Ganther came in motion. Blocks for Marty Johnson. Oh, a little shy on the first down. We'll have third down coming up here. It's the beauty of having a quarterback who graduates in <laughs> two years. We'll have him. He's at, I think his undergrad is economics, and he's going to have his master's in economics. And in the meantime, he's studying tapes and meeting with Mike Sanford and understanding this offensive scheme and what they're trying to do. He's either reading the secondary, reading the front on every single snap. A lot of quarterbacks have that ability now, but they put a lot on the shoulders of Alex. To go with that 9 and 1 starting last year here, 25 and 1 in high school. As he knows what it takes to win football games. Third and a couple. Option look. Bad toss. It's free on the ground. And Johnson able to get back there and cover it, but a huge loss. Jason Jack, the redshirt freshman, second time we've called his name, and all the hype of the young puppies up front for AM 
Well, they're living up to it so far. The one thing that can hurt Utah with a slow developing option against the defensive speed of Texas A&M is that the quarterback has to be ready and the pitch relationship has to be there. That time Marty Johnson got a little bit close, but the quarterback, Alex Smith, after all the praise we just heaped upon him, he was not ready to pitch that football. You know why he wasn't? Because I bet you didn't practice that thing very much. When you're throwing the ball as much as they are, <laughs> you don't have time to run that option in practice. And give Jason Jack, as Mike said, a lot of credit for closing in and being there for his assignment. Second punt for Matt Kovakovich is fair caught to 23 by Terrence Murphy. Two and a half left. First quarter, 7-0 Utah. When we come back, the guys will tell us about their top five as we get the season rolling. ESPN's College Football Primetime is presented by Cooper Tire's Ultimate Bowl Tour. Go to a Cooper dealer near you or visit ultimatebowltour.com to enter. And Rust-Oleum Epoxy Shield for the ultimate garage floor. Uh, just 20 past 6, supper time here in the Mountain Time Zone. Temperature was in the 90s for the last three or four days here in Salt Lake City. It's going to plummet into the 60s here tomorrow. Weather can change very quick in a beautiful part of the country. Aggies with it. Haven't done much on offense yet. 11 plays, 40 yards. Reggie McNeil going to air it out. What's he got up top? Nothing. Intended for Terrence Murphy. The coverage is very good with Ryan Smith. I talked about Reggie McNeil trying to find his rhythm, and the offensive line obviously has to help him, give him time to throw. Lee, you touched on the running game, but I, right now Utah is crowding the line of scrimmage, basically trying to put the game into Reggie McNeil's hands and challenging him in the passing game and saying, listen, until you prove you can beat us in one-on-one -on -one coverage, we're going to crowd the line and we're going to try to continue to put pressure on you. a &M has to hit something downfield to try to slow down this Utah defense. Four receivers. See if McNeil gets some time to take off here. He does over the left side, but Hackenbrook, the linebacker from Bend, Oregon, comes in there. Tommy's tackle makes it third and long. Jill Arrington, offensive line in general, has got to step it up. One guy specifically. That's right. I heard you talk about it earlier. Aldo has his black belt in jujitsu. If you can imagine a guy of his size with a black belt in jujitsu, he earned it over the summer. This is something a lot of football players have started to do, put it into their training regimen. In fact, I just did a story at LSU about it that will be on game day this weekend. LSU puts it in their training, and you know what they did last year with the national championship. Helps his agility, his balance on the field. Take a look at this big guy who can really handle his size. You got to handle pressure here on third and ten, too, Jill. McNeil trying to make something happen, did not. Slipped on his own. Morgan Scally's pressure, though, made a big difference. A penalty marker down. Let's check what it is. Looks like it's going to be on AM. Decline it and have to kick it away. We just talked about the pressure of Utah. This is also about the difference between speed of Utah and. and the speed of Utah and what they can do and how they're going to apply the pressure with different linebackers. Here they're going to try to free it up as much as they can to try to get Scully. The linebackers are coming. The big thing is look at how many red shirts there are and look at the size difference between A&M's offensive line and the quickness of Utah's defensive front. You know, as a coach, the opening game is the one game during the year where coaching adjustments can win a game. And right now, the Utah staff is doing a better job of adjusting than the Texas A&M staff is doing. We might show pressure here on the kicker. Coming off the corner. Jacob Young got it away. Decent kick. On the run, Paris Warren inside midfield. Because they went for the block, there wasn't anybody to block for him. Brought down at the 45 of A&M by Byron Jones. All right, guys, we mentioned top five as of right now. Coach of USC up top. I still think Oklahoma's the best all-around football team in the nation, but I didn't want to pick up again two years in a row. Nice. I like Georgia, Miami. I like them better than Florida State. I think they got more to play for than Florida State right now. That's my five. Well, right now the top five, and this is before the game that USC had against Virginia Tech. I just think the inexperience yeah. on the offensive line and the receivers could catch up with them. Georgia at three, LSU. And I keep an eye on Florida State. I know the game got suspended to next week with Miami. The winner of that game's in really good position. Great field position for Alex Smith in Utah. The AM 45. Incomplete in the middle for Travis Latondris. If you're just coming home from work and uh, didn't hear it, the Miami Florida State game canceled because of the hurricane headed towards South Florida. They will play it 
a week from tomorrow night. National championship game. Who do you think will get there when all said? I like Southern California with Matt Leiner, and I'm picking going. Everybody's picking Smarty Jones in the Belmont, and he didn't win it, so I'm going with West Virginia. Nice schedule, good offense. Who knows? Second and ten. Smith up top. Deep ball incomplete. Intended for Madsen. Byron Jones had a lot of hand to hand fighting there with Madsen. No flag was thrown. Kirk, what's your well, championship pick? Speaking of Smarty Jones, just talking about everybody picking somebody. Yeah. Everybody's picking USC. Yeah, everybody's so, picking Oklahoma also. All right, well, I think everybody's on USC. I mean, weren't they the highest number one team or to separate yeah. the number two in the rest in a long time? I think Oklahoma's going to get there out of the Big 12. I think the winner of the Florida State Miami game ultimately runs the table, which I think that'll be Florida State. Florida State, Oklahoma for the national title. Third and 10, blitz on, pass caught by Savoy. It's going to be very close. Steve Savoy's right at the first down line. When you check the spot, they're going to be a hair shy. Fourth down, about a half yard to go. Decision coming up inside of a minute. Now, Mike Sanford told me, and again, a situation like this, if it's one or two feet, they go with the quarterback sneak. One yard or more, they go with the strong lead block, bringing in all what they call the Tiger set, which is all the big tight ends they got. How far is it? It's about a they go over the quarterback sneak. Quarterback sneak. Right over the right guard. There's nobody there. Right. Walk over the right guard. Smith sends a receiver in motion. Going to hand it to Marty Johnson. And will pick up the first down at the 34-yard run. I'm guessing that this is going to be one that Carl Torbich is going to look back at, whether it's a quarterback sneak or not. Look at the separation. I... It's Look at the separation here. I mean, everybody's on. Somebody clearly is on the wrong side here. Or they forgot a guy <laughs> for that right guard. Not a good defense for fourth and a foot. Winding down to the final play of this first quarter. Utah leading seven to nothing. A little confusion there. A good job by Paris Warren getting everybody who needs to be on the line on the line. Warren's the option back. Smith faked it to him. He's off to the races. First and goal for Utah when the second quarter starts. Jerome Wright, the receiver, was downfield. Blocking for the 24-yard run. Anytime you have an option that's going to take some time to develop, Mike, you touched on it. You've got to be able to come up with some outstanding blocks downfield, and that's exactly what they were able to do. Downfield blocks by the receivers. When Jerome Wright's able to sustain that block, it's going to open things up either for Alex Smith or the running back. Carl Torbus, the defensive coordinator for Texas A&M, has his guys in a tough spot. They'll be first and goal backed up to their own end zone when the second quarter starts. Alex Smith to Steve Savoy, the only touchdown. 11 straight quarters. Utah has not allowed a point. I don't think we have Last year. Set for quarter number two here in Salt Lake City. Call it football prime time. Presented by Cooper Tires. Utah leads 7-0 in their driving. First and goal at the Texas A&M 9. A quarter completely dominated by the Utes. And remember, they lost 20 yards on that fumbled option in the first quarter. Marty Johnson in the backfield with the quarterback, Alex Smith. A beautiful reverse. Will they be able to take it in? Yes, Steve Savoy scores his second touchdown. And on to add the extra point. Savoy has one receiving and one running. 14 to nothing. First time ever this program has been ranked in the preseason poll. Texas A&M's defense gave up a bunch of yards last year. They've dug themselves another hole this year. Savoy finds the end zone for the second time. They had good field position, only 45 yards needed to drive, but 14 nothing as Utah gets on the board again, Coach. Let me show you why that play worked. Now, you keep your eye right there on David Ross. David Ross's responsibility is to come across like this and stop the reverse play, but old David didn't do it. Now, watch him. 
first. Hey, David, not so fast, my friend. Over this way. Oh. And the result is quickly 14 nothing. That fourth down conversion kept the drive going. That fourth in the yard goes through the end zone. So a touchback, and the drive will start at the 20. Dennis Franchoni came to Texas A&M. His team was four and eight last year, and it was uh, quite some time since they've had to deal with an offseason like that. And those final three games were just an unmitigated disaster. They lost them by an average of 44. And what sticks out in everyone's mind was the loss to Oklahoma, a great team, no question about it. But when you lose to Oklahoma 77 to nothing, you get outscored 168 to 37 in the last three games. You have a lot of inner searching to do in the offseason. And now that faith that was built for eight months plus starting to be tested. They're on the road against a good team down 14. The quarterback McNeil, this is what he's comfortable doing, does best, takes a good lick after he picks up a first down. Gain of 14, Morgan Scally on the hit. Mike Dermorale last year was just destroyed, and it's now it's being tested here in the early going. This is kind of getting back to the basics for Reggie McNeil. Right away, coming off the play-action fake, he's a little bit more determined until Scally knocks him out of bounds with a big hit, but he's got a tight end coming around to lead him around the corner and stunts, and then he shows his speed, and he also shows some toughness in taking that hit and getting back up and calling the next play. Boone Stutz transferred. Made a nice play there to give McNeil room to run. From the 35, the snap was poor. He got it to Keith Joseph, but the timing was all screwed up. Lost of a yard to Jonathan Fanene. Slowed by hamstring injuries last year in there to make the tackle. Let's talk about the confidence that needed to be rebuilt because maybe this program didn't hit rock bottom last year but they came pretty darn close to hitting the bottom before they could turn around. Well, I think they may have hit the rock bottom last year. The, you know, they, the, uh, the team was decimated. They had different clicks, and the players and coaches will readily admit that. They talked about team. They took off the names on the back of their jerseys, and they're talking now about playing for the names on the front of the jerseys, and all that talk is being tested right now. McNeil was hit as he threw. The pass was incomplete. Sione Boa. Boa. He had the pressure that forced the incompletion. McNeil is one of seven. And one of the reasons I said maybe they didn't hit rock bottom last year, I agree with you. Never thought I'd get that low. We don't know where they're going yet this year. They may have a long year in them as well this season. As young as they are. But look, this is something we've seen here. Almost every time he drops back to throw, he's getting pressure. He's been hurried six or seven times already in this football game when he sits back in that pocket and when he tries to roll to the left or roll to the right. He can't get comfortable. And as we talked about, find that rhythm. Three-man line. They bring pressure from a half dozen. McNeil hit as he threw again. The pass is incomplete. So they only had three up front. McNeil took a clean lick from Bo Nagahi. And McNeil slow to get up after that one. Well, every, every defense in college football runs this. You're going to see a zone blitz. Defensive end's going to drop, and then they're going to bring four strong. Problem is, the offensive line in the backs didn't pick it up. And again, once again, Reggie McNeil feels the pressure from the outside. This time, they came with the nickel back, who was close enough to get the pressure on Reggie McNeil. you got to give a lot of credit to the defensive coordinator, Kyle Whittingham. Mm -hmm. He's calling a brilliant oh, game God. so far with his blitzes and covers. Like he did seemingly all of last year. Jacob Young to kick. Oh, he just got it away. Quick release, kicked it high. Utah players getting out of the way. They'll be down at the 45. It's Morgan Scally, who's had a couple of big hits on defense already, who nearly got there. Thus a 21-yard punt. What they did that time, Utah brought the man from the outside who was not supposed to be blocked anyhow, but the center snap was good, but the kicker fumbled the ball. And if you don't get the ball off quickly, that outside guy's going to come every time. And yeah. let me tell you something right now. If they get this score right here, I'm telling you, yeah. it's, it's going to be a long year. And knowing, not a game. knowing Urban Meyer, I'm don't be surprised you. to see him go for a big one here. Savoy's had success getting behind coverage. He's at the bottom of the screen. Fake the handoff. Looking for Savoy. Got a step. Ooh. And one more little bit of air under that.
that ball, and it's 20 to nothing. See, that, that yeah. just goes to show you. First yeah. of all, it shows you Urban Meyer's personality. He want, he, he's feeling right now that they've got a chance to jump on top of a team that's vulnerable with their psyche. The second thing is, every time Savoy gets downfield in one-on-one -on -one coverage, he goes right by Byron Jones, who, by the way, is Texas A&M's best cover guy. Second time they missed him downfield where he's had about a four or five yard separation from the DB. And fundamentally that's not sound. The back is supposed to go back, back, back and not turn his body. That's why they're beating him deep. Melvin Bullitt now has Savoy in coverage. Second and ten. The Marty Johnson run takes it across midfield. Into a &M territory of the Aggie. 48. Well, we mentioned Labor Day weekend presented by Rustolium Apoxy Shield. Oregon State LSU will get it going down in Baton Rouge. College game day built by the Home Depot. Be there 10.30 a.m. Eastern time as you start every Saturday. And then same time over on ESPN2, the debut for Sylvester Croom. Much talked about the first African-American head coach in the Southeastern Conference. His Mississippi State Bulldogs in Starkville to take on Tulane. It's on ESPN, ESPN2 this weekend. Need to get to the 45 to keep the drive alive. They'll have to do it from five yards farther back. A lot of talk about Urban Meyer, age 40. Snap, ball start, offense, 97, five-yard penalty, still third down. Willie Sow, backup tight end. Urban was the head coach at Bowling Green and a very successful couple of seasons of program building there and hired out here in Utah. And you know there will be a ton of rumors and we'll get into this later on yep. over the next couple of years as things keep going well here because he's a guy if you spend an hour or five hours or a week around that you say you know what no wonder a lot of schools would be a lot better off if he was running their program yep. it's not disrespect to coaches in places it's respect for that guy now it's third and long and not getting pressure Matson couldn't hang on John Matson, the junior receiver out of Utah, West Valley City, couldn't pull it in. Melvin Bullitt was there in coverage. Well, you mentioned a great point there. I made it a point in the pregame show that if Carl Torbush and Texas A&M didn't hit this guy, Alex Smith, they're going to be in a long problem. They tried a three-man rush that time and tried to do something trick and didn't get to him. They got to hit that guy. Even if they get him up another touchdown, they got to knock him out of the game. <laughs> Here's the... Uh... Another odd punch formation. Matt Kovakovich to kick away. And him try to get there. Murphy will let it go into the end zone. And it's a touchback. There are more different ways to protect punts. Yeah. No. <laughs> Guys stay up. Special teams coaches all spring. One quick point. You know who invented that kick? Who? Ben Schwartzwaller, Syracuse Orange, years ago. What year? If you are just joining us, show you what's been happening between Utah and Texas A&M. It has arrived at 14-0 thanks to Steve Savoy, the catch and go for the sophomore, who was second team freshman All-American last year. 78 yards there. And then our first and goal on the first play of the second quarter, nine yards on the run. Steve Savoy on his way to a Reggie Bush night. A couple of touchdowns for a sophomore. Reggie Bush of USC had the great touchdown performance in USC's opening win on ESPN Saturday night. Flag here will put Texas A&M back to first and 15. Prior to the snap, ball start, offense, 74, five-yard penalty, still first down. From a steamer penalized there. Well, those numbers aren't good. Not all his fault, hasn't had a lot of support, hasn't had a lot of time, but the numbers aren't good. Clock is screwed up, guys. It says a minute 24. That's wrong. And they catch it on the field. There you go, 12.49. Corrected and ready to go. Sorry, Kirk. Well, I was just going to say, it doesn't talk about the hurries and the pressure every single time he's, he's dropping back. And also the, the great scheme so far from Kyle Whittingham of Utah. It's been a long first half for Reggie McNeil and the Aggies. A run with Courtney Lewis, the thousand yard rusher last year, only gets a couple against his good Utah defense. Down again to Jill Arrington. 
Speaking of Utah's defense, not good news over here. Three of their starters are out for the game. They're all knee injuries. We've got Eric Weddle, Kavika Costco, and Steve Fafita. They will reevaluate Steve at halftime, but it looks like all three are out for the game. Now, I saw them working on Steve Savoy. Looks like they put a wrap around his rib cage. No official word there, but I'll check on him for the offense. All right, Jim. That's uh, both of their safeties with the strong safety spot. Weddle and then Costco right behind him. Second down pass is a nice move and a lot of open field for Terrence Murphy, who has amazing speed. Good job reading the downfield block of Irvin Taylor to get out to the 48-yard line. They needed one of those, 34 yards. It's almost more offense than they had the whole game. This is this is interesting. Joe just talked about some of the, the safeties. Mike, you touched on it also. You got Casco, who's out right now. They have Fletcher, a corner, who's battling a severe ankle sprain. You could see right there when Murphy made the cut, Fletcher couldn't adjust with him. And then once Terrace Murphy gets out of the open field, finally AM shows that they have some athletes on their side of the ball. But Gerald Fletcher, number three, playing with a severely turned ankle from during the two days. There's been a well timed report there from Jill. Let's see if AM can exploit it. Right back in the hands of Murphy. This time he spilled a good open field tackle. Bring up second down. They've had to go deep into the depth chart to go bring up Casey Evans, who is not among the top eight defensive backs coming in here to the game. And you guys seen this a hundred times in all the games you've watched, but remember that last series when I talked about the defense had better hold them now where mm -hmm. it's all over? Yeah. They held them, and now the offense has got a little bit of spark. If they could just get something on the scoreboard and get anything off of that zero, they're still in this ball game. Sure. Kyle Whittingham was the defensive coordinator for Ron McBride, the longtime head coach, retained by Urban Meyer, and has done a terrific job. Another free snap flag. On the Aggies. Ball start. Offense. 76. Five yard penalty. Still second down. That's our jiu jitsu guy, Aldo De La Garza. You talk about Kyle Winnington. His dad, Fred, was one of the top football coaches I've ever coached again. So when he was at BYU, he's a tremendous defensive coach. Kyle played in the Holiday Bowl game against my Indiana team. He was a I tremendous know, linebacker. Know. Kirk, that guy's like the Buckeye linebacker. He'd hit you. You see him? Yep. Mean. He man. looks like it, doesn't he? He was a good it, football his player. His defense every single year, same characteristics. Hard-nosed team play, play all the way to the whistle, every snap. And terrific to schooling of the defensive players to get the hand up and knock it down. Corey Dodds came in, the stud linebacker, strong side backer. Guy who uh, Whittingham described yesterday as nasty. I like to hear that about your line. He's nasty. I want to finish the point before this replay. I want to finish the point about Fred Whittingham. He passed away last year in the middle of the season, yeah. and Kyle Whittingham just continued to coach like an aggressive guy. That guy is full of character. You talk about one of the best defensive coordinators in the country. Kyle Whittingham is one of them. Third down. They need to get to the Utah 38. McNeil does have time, can't deliver, over the middle. In and out of the hands, Terrence Thomas, and once again, McNeil ends up on his back. So even though Utah gave up the big play, the 34-yard run by Murphy, still have to punch it away. Opening weekend, you're going to have mistakes, but there are a lot of coaches, coordinators, players that are watching this game, getting ready to play their first game in about 48 hours. Coaches are sitting there taking notes, talking about, see, did you guys watch the game last night? <laughs> because AM just created a little bit of momentum, then they self-destructed, and that slowed down this drive when they continue to have these silly penalties. This time, a little pressure. Jacob Young still able to get it away. Paris won. A fair catch at the 19. And it'll be a long field, and a penalty marker came down. The halo, rule well, well, the, the halo rule does not exist oh. anymore. It was <laughs> taken off the books two years ago. Well, that one looked like it. When there was a traveling two-yard bubble around. Traveling two-yard bubble. <laughs> around the <laughs> pass catcher. I want to say this uh, before the game is over next week. <laughs> we got a couple hours. No, Jacob Young <laughs> is too slow. Yeah. Let me finish it. Yep. No, you're right. You're right. right. Okay. If Jackie Sherrill was here, he'd oh. have the snap. <laughs> he'd have the stop watch. Stop watch. They're going to block Jacob Young's punt. Be this game or next week or the week after guarantees too slow. Check catch interference on the kicking team. 88, 15-yard penalty. First down. Talking about self-destructing and mistakes I instead know. of starting back at their own 18. It'll be out at the 33. Dennis Franchoni's team, five possessions, five punts. 
no points. ESPN's College Football Prime Time. Brought to you by Budweiser. Grab a cold, fresh Budweiser. It's game time. And Hummer. Check out the H2 at Hummer.com. Hummer, like nothing else. Uh, the mountains make the weather changes beautiful and dramatic here. Looks like we're going to have a storm rolling through. Utah continuing where uh, its season left off last year, leading 14 0, five minutes in, second quarter. Mike Tarico, Lee Corso, Kirk Herbstreit, Jill Arrington, glad you're with us. We start the first of 14 weeks of college football on Thursdays here on ESPN, or next week on ESPN 2. Penalty took it out to the 35, so Marty Johnson takes it from there. The running back is stopped and swarmed by the Aggie defense. Down to Jill Arrington again. Jill? Hey, Mike, one of the things we heard from the players was their renewed motivation thanks to the must. You see them right there, the mighty Utah student section. They're loud, they're proud, they're proud, proud to, to cheer for Texas. I can't even hear. They're proud to cheer for Utah. One of the reasons for their success, though, is because Coach Urban Meyer, he really pushed that. He wants to get the students involved. In fact, he goes to the dorms, he hangs out with the students, he goes through the Greek system. He really wants them to feel like they're the 12th man. They call it the Utah man. He's out there, too. It's something that he feels is really important, and the players really feel like they like to play for these students that are cheering for them. It gives them more motivation. Oh, Jill, get away from them safely, please. Yes. We'll get a timeout to get you away from there. Their enthusiasm is great. It's part of Urban trying to energize and build a program. We'll talk about that when we come back. Last year, Utah was picked fifth in the Mountain West. They won the outright conference title, something they had not done in nearly a half century. Preseason polls for the first time in school history, and a good start so far, leading 14 to nothing and really dominating Texas A&M. And as we went to the break, we were talking about how Urban Meyer has come in here and really given this uh, program a shot of energy. It's the system on the field, but as Jill was alluding to, it's creating an atmosphere of uh, intensity and making this stadium, Rice Eccles, which is beautiful, a very tough place to play. After the timeout by Utah, it's second and ten. Same play back to Marty Johnson. Texas A&M's defense has answered the call on back-to-back -back running plays. You know, Mike has used his wife Shelly, and they go around and talk to the players and everything. I think that's a tremendous thing to bring your family into it. But I got one tip for my man Urban. Don't put your wife down there if you start losing. <laughs> get, her up, get her up in the press box as far as you can. I got experience. Lou she's in row one right oh, there. Row one, Urban, but right still. There. Somebody in the Corso house knows about that? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, my record, Betsy was up at the top. <laughs> Away from the student <laughs> section, right? At least she came a couple of times. <laughs> Third and ten. Aggies bring four. Smith throws first down. And more with Latondris. Travis Latondra still going. All the way to the 20. Stop him on a couple of runs. Got him third and 10. Couple of poor tackles. 45-yard gain for the senior from El Dorado Hills, California. They've been taking advantage of this in three and four wide receivers when they split it inside man one on one opportunity here for Latondras going up against Brown and he simply beats him against Hodge there simply beats him and what a great athletic move by Latondras to get the hand down how many times the coaches work oh, on yeah. that in individual drills nice job to keep the hand on pick more yards up. straight all option and Smith takes it out to about the 15 yard line Justin Warren the rover came up to make the tackle another marker is down first game seen a lot of penalties eight so far five on A&M three on Utah now make it four with that illegal block See if he comes close to yeah. touching here when he puts his hand down tremendous move he did ah, touch. He touched. He did touch good thing this isn't the Big Ten oh yeah an issue there. Say, we have an issue they give you a little heads up for those Big issue. Ten games you'll be watching at noon on Saturdays on ESPN technician would have had to work quick there wait a minute Flag for the chop block. Remain first down. Go ahead, coach. Is that one of the plays that you can review? Yeah. Was a knee down like that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the problem is, 
will they have the time? You know, that, that's going to be really an exciting thing to see in the Big Ten this year. Because like, it's not coach's challenge. Exactly. Oh, yeah. You're not going to have the red flag out there. It's going to be the technician seeing something right away, re uh, rewinding it, checking it out before the play's already called for the next play. You have to do it pretty quick. The technical advisor, a former official in every case, will have a TiVo unit. If you have TiVo at home, you know, you back it up and you check yeah. the play again. He will be watching the feed of the game that you watch at home, and if there's something obvious. But same thing as the NFL. If the next play is run, boom, it's over. Okay. Uh -huh. You have that this weekend, Mike, in Ann Arbor. Right? Kiona, first and 24. Over the middle, Smith complete to Paris Warren. He's brought down at the 22-yard line. And the Central Florida uh, taking on Wisconsin on ESPN, Miami of Ohio, Michigan. A couple of other Big Ten games are at Ohio noon State Eastern. Cincinnati. Yeah. Right, and a couple of those games that are at the noon Eastern. Those will be the first ever games in college football history where we will have replay available in the non-conference Big Ten games. It's up to the road team to say yes or no. Four did not, many did. There are probably going to be some kinks along the way. I just like the idea of it. I like the idea of having a chance to correct mistakes and see if it works out. Second and 12. Three receivers, bottom of the screen. To the other side, it's Paris Warren. It's another first and goal for Utah. Ronald Jones made the tackle. But Utah is just locked in right now against this Aggie defense. What they're doing is they, they have Paris, who's their best receiver, Paris Warren, number five, off to the left, in one-on-one -on -one coverage every single time right now, moving down the field. It's been Warren, it's been Latondras, it's been different receivers, one-on-one. -on -one. It's pitch and catch with these choice routes with Alex Smith. Because the offensive line are keeping the defensive line off of Smith. That's where the game is won, right there, that pass protection. First and goal. Going for a three-score lead. Smith will run it and take it in. How about 20 to nothing, Utah? Smith's having uh, any kind of a good season opener here. I think he's yeah. dialed in, Mike. <laughs> he's <laughs> Brian Morrison good on the extra point. Well, he's 9 for 14, passing for 201 yards. 65-yard drive engineered there. He's done so well, let him take it in for six. Utah 21 nothing, and here's how they got the last six. Utah's offensive lineman, Capullo, right there, 6'4", 300 pounds. Watch him pull as he comes through here and blocks the linebacker. The reason why this play goes is the left tackle does a sensational job right there. Drops his hit and <laughs> touchdown. The offensive line from Utah, in my opinion, is winning this football game. Running and pass protection. There's that guy, Capullo, didn't play against a and last year. He's from Hawaii. You know, he came to this school as a 190-pound safety. What the heck is he eating? He's over well, 300 pounds. 110 pounds late. It's a little asterisk. He wants mission, but still, he comes back at 300 pounds and a road grade. No return for Terrence Murphy. Unfortunately for Texas A&M, they have returned to what happened at the end of last year. 21 to nothing. This is a Utah defense that has not allowed a point in now 11 and a half consecutive quarters. It's a Texas A&M team manhandled in its final three games last year, 168 to 37. If you tack on tonight, it's 188 to 37. They've got nothing going offensively. And right now, they're just searching for some place to find some confidence against a Utah team that hasn't missed a beat from its 10 and 2 championship season out here in the Mountain West last year. It had been that long, the leather helmet era, since Utah won a conference title. Quarterback keeps. Quarterback on his back. Again, Reggie McNeil loses 10. Corey Dodds, the guy I told you is nasty. Here, another good play. That was a heck of a play there by Dodds, showing his athletic, athletic ability. But that play has really been the story for Reggie McNeil throughout this first half. Almost every single time he has dropped back to throw, he has felt pressure. He's been hit seven or eight times. He's been on his back. And I tell you,
they're looking to him for leadership, guys. And right now, you look into his eyes, I think he's looking for someone else to try to help him out. Support me. Well, help me make a play. Help me help you. I've heard that somewhere. Yeah. Jerry Maguire line. Second and 20. There's a quick hit for about seven yards to Terrence Murphy. Terrence Murphy, a senior, is one of those guys who had the ability to go to the next level and had the opportunity to perhaps be taken in the NFL draft, but chose to come back. He did not want to leave on last year's note, last year's 4-8. and eight. Doesn't look good right now, but Terrence Murphy will hang in there. His couple of catches here tonight have made him the all-time pass catcher in Texas a and history, replacing Bethel Johnson. to get to the 30 the pressure's on McNeil tripped as he threw incomplete I'll tell you Gerald Fletcher playing on that sprained ankle got enough of a hand on McNeil to throw him off balance and these Utah fans are supporting one heck of a defense we talked about Fletcher playing with the ankle but he's going to come from the blitz here it's very simple corner blitz from the boundary Reggie McNeil feels it I think and he starts to get away from the pressure just because of that speed of Fletcher but it was too late he had an open man downfield but again Kyle Winningham the defensive coordinator pushing the right buttons at the right time Jacob Young to kick it away again Logan Scally showing pressure at the bottom of the screen 25 he's picked up nice job of protecting opportunity for a return but Warren lets it bounce and rightly so will be down at the 48-yard line. The deep snapper, William Stutz, able to stop it. That nonstop from Salt Lake City to Baton Rouge for you guys. Yes, College game day starts your Saturday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, and then Labor Day weekend presented by Rustoleum Epoxy Shield rolls on. Pac-10 against the SEC. Don't see that that often. And down south from here, Notre Dame takes on BYU at 9.15 Eastern time. That's your back-to-back -back doubleheader. Now, both games are available like tonight's, on ESPN HD in stunning high definition. What you call your cable operator, Direct TV, Dish Network. Go to one of those Best Buys, get yourself a good HD TV, and go get them all football season. It looks awesome. First down run for Marty Johnson. He takes it across midfield for a pickup of about five. Our booth, we actually have an HD TV where I can watch the game. It's my first it's HD experience. I, I like it. It's beautiful. You get used to this all season. Well. Last year, down at uh, Kyle Field, it was 21-0. Utah staged a huge second-half comeback. What Dennis Franchoni can hope for is that his players remember that and can return the favor on the road here tonight. Quick toss to LaTondras. Big catch in the first, uh, last drive, I should say. It's within a yard and a half of the first down there. Jackson Appel, top tackler on this team, made the play. Although they were losing 21 nothing last year, Utah, Utah in that ball game ran 97 offensive plays. <laughs> they were about to explode the whole game. That's not the case with the Texas A&M offense right now. They're struggling. I don't think. I'll give you the halftime adjustments. What I think they got to do, but okay. I'll tell you one thing: they're in big time trouble because this Utah is a better football team than Texas A&M. Playing with a purpose, too. Yeah, Both right. sides of the ball. Very well coached. Mm. Third and a yard. And Quinton Ganther, a junior college transfer out of Citrus Community College, gets the first down. We haven't seen Steve Savoy back in the game. Jill, have an update down there? I do have an update on him. He is in the locker room getting x-rays on his ribs. He took a real big hit to the ribs. He's really sore. They're checking him out. Doesn't seem to be facing Utah, though. They have a lot of playmakers, or else Alex will just take care of it for himself. Alex Smith, the quarterback, Jill has done a terrific job so far here tonight controlling this offense and giving them the big lead. Alex Smith back up top. Wide open, John Matson. 27 nothing. 38 yards. And this is getting embarrassing for Texas A&M. Wow. 
Carl Torbus. I think he's surprised the way his defense is playing. Yeah. <laughs> Can't believe it. An extra point off the upright and no good. So Brian Borison has missed seven in his career. Unable to convert there, and it remains 27 0 after the Madsen touchdown. This is a great job again of execution by Alex Smith. Not only the fake here to Madsen, oh. he looks the safety off. Look at the safety running to the middle of the field. Alex Smith used his eyes to freeze him, but the pump just froze the corner, and then he's just walking down the sidelines. Madsen is into the end zone. But nice job by Alex Smith showing that experience, looking to the middle of the field to hold that safety. You know, Mike Sanford, the offensive coordinator from Utah told us that Matson at 6'5", 220 was the most improved offensive football player on his team and he thought he becomes a great weapon this year and I tell you what that was as you said it was a nice move by Smith but it was also a nice pass route by John Matson 6'5", 220 from West Valley City, Utah. I think that's the biggest difference with this Utah team. You have a veteran quarterback, offensive line is better, the depth at tailback, and now it's not just Paris Warren out there by himself for Alex Smith. Paris, or Paris Warren's out there, but now he's got a, a bunch of receivers to be able to throw the football to. He's spreading it around tonight. It's a dangerous team, guys. This is not, wow, a and -M. Boy, there it might be a combination of both here, yeah, but Utah is a very, very good team and a legitimate top 20 team. We will talk in the second half because, gosh, we'll have time. Oh, yeah. We'll what break it up with you, Ty. It's uh, out of bounds, so the ball will come out to the 35 for Texas A&M to start. Oh, man, it's been seven, eight, nine months. I've been looking forward to What's this. What's he have for us? Let's go check into the studio, see what Chris Fowler can add to the telecast tonight. <laughs> hey, buddy. Well, it's the Pontiac High Performance Halftime Report. Trevor and Mark join me. We'll have a latest on the hurricane postponements, breakdown of the Big 12 Conference, and the new instant replay of the Big Ten you guys were talking about. Yeah. And the Big 12 Conference. I'll tell you why you can forget about those two losses the Sooners had at the end of last season. Keeping in the Big 12, we'll talk about Texas and how Texas actually can beat Oklahoma and oh, win the really? Big 12 championship. You're not picking the Aggies to win the Big 12. No. no. Staying away from that one. Right? Stay away from that The one. Pontiac High Performance half from the a and tries to regroup there. All right, guys. Thank you. Trev and Mark. Look forward to seeing you with Chris there in the studio. Already looking ahead to the uh, October 9th game for the Longhorns against Oklahoma in Dallas. Texas opens this week at home against North Texas. First down run for Courtney Lewis. He takes it over to the 40 to the uh, 41 yard line. Dante Hall, the super stud in the NFL now. He's the last time a Texas A&M back took it for a thousand yards in a season before Lewis did it in his freshman year when he ran for a thousand twenty four last year. Is that the first time you've called his name tonight? Hey, only a couple. I think he's been there four times. Well, no words are needed for that grab. Yeah. Uh, hello. Throw from McNeil with a lot of coverage down there intended for Jason Carter. Incomplete. The guys back in the studio were just talking about Texas and Oklahoma. The big boys in the Big 12 uh, expected again this year. It was uh, the Oklahoma 77 to nothing game as the Heisman where Jason White and company put on a clinic against Texas A&M. McNeil, as I mentioned, was wearing a different number than 16. Uh, that's when the question started about this Texas A&M program and some of the reality perhaps started setting in that maybe this program has places to go before they can turn it around. It's got so used to eight wins out of the Aggies every year. McNeil keeping a first down and more. There's his explosiveness into the secondary. Might take it all the way. Roger McNeil touchdown. 59 yards and boy they needed that. And for the first time in almost 12 quarters, Utah has been scored upon. Extra point try for Todd Pegram, junior kicker out of Plano. Chad Schroeder holds for him, and it's 27-7. 
maybe this will be the thing to get Reggie McNeil and this A&M offense going before they hit the showers at halftime. It's nothing really fancy for Texas A&M, just utilizing the athletic ability. Now watch him reverse pivot, 31, Casey Evans gets out of position, and then he gets in the open field, and this is what he's used to doing, whether it's been in high school or Texas A&M. When you get Reggie McNeil into the open field, he can make people miss. Keep your eye on number 81, Joey Thomas, the tight end. He's the blocker right there that cuts the first defender down, cuts the second defender down, and Oh, by Touchdown. the way, was he the blocker or the tackler? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, whatever he did, it worked. When the score is 27 to 7, you're allowed to do anything you want. <laughs> good, 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 if they don't score, everybody leaves the game. Do you want to see that again? Good, yeah, let's tackle. See. Actually, the defense that, could use him. That was him. not bad. That's right. Put, put Joey Thomas on the other side of the ball. That's how you wrap up. That's right. They said they were poor tacklers last year. Yeah, I'm telling you. I don't think it factored into the play. I think he no, was out of the play. No, was, no. What do you mean it didn't factor into the play? <laughs> he was gone. He was past him. He couldn't get back. He danced by him. No, <laughs> he don't try to make field. up now. Don't try to walk. You brought out that poor Joey Thomas <laughs> and made him look bad. <laughs> now you're trying to make up to him. Well, there's one of the great traditions. And this is a school with the best football traditions around. Some have uh, just as good, but <clears throat> Kyle Field, uh, the Aggies, the, the students who stand for every game all the time, and the 12th man. There is John Ray, who grew up going to Texas A&M games. The legacy and legend of the 12th man is now to a kick cover, representing the student body. And Ray, a former walk-on, wears number 12, covering the second kick of his life here. Right out to the 23-yard line. Ronald Jones made the tackle. All right, let's see how John Ray from Giddings, Texas, did wear in the number 12. It's all about form and technique and, and, and want to. Get downfield. Come on, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. The guy, unfortunately, is going to take it to the left there. That's all right. Little con Did he get any contact? Did he hit anything? Come on, come on. That's all right. Warm up. Right, They're ready for the next touchdown. He'll be ready. He got, he got to wear the 12 as the 12th man once last year. It was the Oklahoma game, 77 to nothing. He got to cover one kick. First down, Utah and Smith, they want to respond right away. Incomplete marker down, pass interference. Justin Walker, a 10-7, 100-meter speed man, stretched the defense. Byron Jones flag, 15 yards. Did you see Byron Jones getting upset? You know why he's upset is because the safety left him. The safety left him out in the island. Against the defense. Number 11, 15 yards from the previous spot. First down. It, it, that's going to happen. I mean, you're going to find with this young defense, guys are going to make mistakes and bite up into different areas. And one thing that you're going to find, Jackson Appel's got to be able to get back there. As a safety, you've got to be able to help your, your, your corner and not leave him out in an island, especially when he's expecting to have safety support behind him. Otherwise, you're going to give up those, those deep passes all day long. So from the 39, first down, Utah. Keep going after it. Why not? Incomplete for John Madsen. He was the intended receiver there. Melvin Bullock back on the coverage. Another marker came down in the secondary. Pass interference. Offense. 23. 15 yard penalty. Repeat first down. Think of a number there, did they? I didn't hear one. It's Interested to see where that was. In any case, it'll be first and long coming up. On this one, they're going to call offensive pass interference, I guess, because he pushed off from right there. Number 23 pushed off on the defender, and that's the reason. Wow. John Madsen again. I don't know. That was a sneaky kind of a play. I, don't, I like it with 27 to 7. I like that call. Keep the game closed. Well, are you honest? <laughs> First and 25, here goes Marty Johnson to the 37-yard line. You know, Marty Johnson out of Sacramento, California. If you weren't with us earlier, we mentioned it is his seventh year of eligibility. His career started over at Boise State in 98, played a year there, transferred to Butte Junior College, played a couple. 2001, he came here, 
and, and did a good job. 95 yards in the opener against Utah State, but hurt out the rest of the season. 2002, he plays two games, led the nation in rushing. He was averaging like 230 yards, but suffered a knee injury. Ended this season. NCAA gave him an extra year of eligibility. Here he is in his seventh year. His quarterback is brought down there as Alex Smith is sacked. First good pressure, Red Bryan, 85. Chris Harrington, 92. Jason Jack, 89. I mentioned them all because they all made the play, and they're all redshirt freshmen. And those are the players who Texas A&M's future is being built upon. You know, they had this council that the players elected, the players who represent them, and that kid, Brian, Joseph Red Bryant, is the first redshirt freshman Dennis Francione ever had elected to the leadership council. Great player and a great leader in the future. Third and 18, need to take it all the way out to midfield to keep the drive alive. Off the hands. Once again of John Madsen. Incomplete. They'll kick it away and here again Jill Arrington. It's really, really quiet on this Texas A&M sidelines. McNeil kind of lit them up for a second, but the coaches have been in the face of the players saying, guys, you've got to believe. We're okay. You've got to continue to believe. That's what it's come down to. Believe in the program. Get back to what they've worked on. Keep their heads up. That's what they're preaching. I don't know if the players are buying into it. We'll see what happens. That's a good point, Jill, because uh, Kirk was talking about this this morning. We'll get into it here after the punt. Terrence Murphy says get away and it's out of bounds at the 27. That's what you were talking about how fragile it was going to be for these guys if they had any sort of stress or angst early on in the game. Well a third of these players that made this trip have never played in a college football game. So Jill's right. I mean and you could see from even from up here who's going to take control is the leadership there after the season they had last year and after every, all the build up of this offseason the way this first half has started besides the coaches. Who's going to be accountable? Who's going to be in that huddle and on the sidelines trying to rally the troops? They need to catch a break. They, they, they got one. Now they got to get another one to try to get themselves to believe that they can come back. But right now you're not seeing a lot of a lot of talk down there from the boys in the white. Yeah. Thrown to that number of the junior college players who transferred their first big time on the road experience. Reggie McNeil first down pass. Incompletely. Now, from a coach's standpoint, I know 27 to 7 is bad, but if they turn this ball over and it's 34 to 7, I'm going home. No. Because it's all over. Red, because, red eyes. But my point time. I make to you is this do not do anything stupid here. Go in with 27 to 20 and come back and win this football game. I hope they don't turn it over and the other opponents will score. I know that's conservative, but they've got to do it right now, in my opinion. Go to run here. Just get out. Oh, absolutely. I got you. From the 24, Reggie McNeil. Down the middle, incomplete. Oh. Intended for Terrence Murphy. As advertised, your Pontiac High Performance Halftime Report coming up from the studio with Chris Fowler, Trevin Mark there as well. We'll talk about uh, the impending hurricane and the impact of the postponement of Monday night's scheduled Florida State Miami game, which will move to Friday. We'll talk about this uh, Big 12, where the teams the top. Settle down and settle in in the instant replay that we discussed earlier, which will come to college football in the Big Ten this year. Pontiac high performance halftime report. Let it go. Reggie McNeil, four of 17 passing tonight, and been sacked a few times as well. Ryan Smith brings him down. It's the third sack. He's been knocked down a half dozen other times. Utah takes a timeout and finally gets it called five seconds too late. They've been bringing a blitz every time on third down. He's going to cheat. Hodge is going to cheat and then come down, and he's the guy that actually gets to Reggie McNeil. McNeil's going to feel pressure to the left. He wants to turn to the right, but there's the corner. Every time Utah, as a defense, gets to third and seven, third and ten, you're seeing Whittingham, the defense coordinator, push the buttons and bring that corner. How many times have we seen yeah. the corner come from the boundary? Now, I, I know I can tell from being around you a little bit and talking what was on your mind from the offseason. And you've asked a lot in talking to coordinators and coaches here early season about the zone blitz and zone blitz pressure. It's not where it's a nuance anymore. It's almost a mandatory part of a successful defense in this day and age. And my question is, how does an offense handle a zone blitz? Well, you're seeing different offenses handle it different ways. It, the zone blitz now has been around college football for so long. Most offenses are using some kind of slide protection to go towards the, the blitz. And, and that way, you're protected. You maximize the blitz that way. You protect yourself. The quarterback, if things change and go the other way, has to be accountable for the other side. But offensive lines have adjusted 
it, and quarterbacks have done so much film study that I think they're used to seeing this, these zone blitzes. There's also something called sight adjustment, which means if that guy comes, a good quarterback would have hit that man. I'll guarantee they don't do that against uh, Alex Smith. No way. He's torching. Utah took the timeout, preserved some time. Let's see if they get a punt return or pressure. Well, Jacob Young was rushed. He got it away. Fair catch called for and well executed by Paris Warren. So the Aggie offense has uh, seen a lot of this guy. Jacob Young, seven punts. The lone possession that wasn't a punt was the 59-yard touchdown run by McNeil. Now, here's a team that's not going to be conservative no, I don't, 41 but, seconds. Yeah, but I, I'm telling you, they just stopped the clock three times by passing it, thank you very much Utah would have used its time perfect but they wouldn't have them now that's right and they only had two going into that series thank you very much why not now, that's not second guessing it's first guessing I didn't like that series back there I didn't like it why not slip behind coverage like you've done <laughs> the entire first half here we had some coverage issues here I think five receivers in the pattern and wide open spinning out of bounds after the game of nine once again, John Madsen, a big receiver, has been busy tonight. It's been one of two things. The defensive backs either freeze at 7 to 10 yards and get, there's some confusion and the receivers are getting by them and being able to find the open receiver downfield or he has so much time that the routes in between coverage, the, the seams, the zone, where the linebackers would be, how many times have we seen Alex Smith be able to find an open man across the middle at about 8 to 10 yards? Second and one. Smith is flushed, kept his balance, got the first down. Warren gets out of bounds. Oh, maybe he didn't get the first down. As Paris Warren pivoted to go forward, he did end up getting the first down. And Alex, stops the clock. Well, Alex Smith finally got outside of the pocket a little bit because there's some pressure on him, but he makes a really good play. Now, here's the situation it is. It's short yardage. They have used the play. I haven't seen on short yards a long time. They get in the Tiger set, and they bring a back across, and they bring him. And look what they're doing now. Third down, and a foot yoke. Yeah, I was wrong. I missed it by a yard. They were back behind the 32-yard line, so they need a couple of inches. Smith is pressured, threw it away, and uh, that ball did not get past the line of scrimmage. Uh, there's a penalty marker down there in the pocket. Let's see if they call grounding. Intention yep. down yep. on the offense. Bill Lawson down at the spot of the foul. Fourth down. Out of that tackle box area or didn't cross the line of scrimmage in the air, and that's what happened there, and that'll take him out of field goal range as well. AM this time is able to get pressure on Alex Smith. He's going to sit in the pocket, and it's it's just a four-man rush. They didn't bring any pressure. They actually got after it up front, and this time they were able to get to Alex Smith. Johnny Jolly beat his man one-on-one. -on -one. That's a perfect example of the rule. The line of scrimmage was the 32. They only needed an inch, and the ball hit right on the back end of the 35-yard line. Third and an inch, and you're throwing the football. You tell me why. I don't care philosophy or not. If they weren't ahead 27 to 7, I bet you wouldn't. Novakovic. On to punt. A lot of hang time. And then checks out. And it's down to the 14. 4.7 seconds of hang time. And it's live outside of Rice Eccles Stadium. Boy, this entire campus had such a change when the Olympics were here a couple of years ago. Had a commuter school feel to it. But when they had to build an Olympic Village for the athletes of the world for the Winter Games, it left Utah, the university, with some great residuals, including some terrific dorms. You add that to a beautiful place, a, a very good academic school, and now that enrollment of uh, 28,000 plus is really enjoying the benefits. I think this is the hidden gem, maybe in all of Division I-A college football. And Urban Meyer's kind of exposing it now because of the success. But between the, the beauty of coming out to the mountains and the resources of the facilities, it's, it's exceptional. Courtney Lewis didn't do much running the ball. He'll get a yard there. And see, it should bring us to the end of the half. Pushing and shoving going on as the whistles blow. Lewis, the 1,000-yard rusher from last year, held in check the entire offense. Dismantled. Lewis only had eight yards. Jill's with Dennis Franchone. Coach Fran, a tough first half. You're down 20 points. What is it that Utah's doing that's causing so much confusion? 
Well, I don't know if they're causing confusion. They're executing awful well. They haven't turned the ball over, and I don't think we've played particularly well on offense. We've kind of been off on a few passes when we've had people open. We were ahead 21 nothing last year at half, so we just got to come out and hope we reverse the table on that. Coach, you've said it. You have a lot of young players. What will you tell this young team to come out and get back to your game plan in the second half? Just keep fighting. We haven't had a lot of good things happen for, for us in this game so far, and maybe we can have some in the second half. All right, Coach, good luck. Back to you, Mike. Jill, thank you. Stats in the first half. Utah, 318 yards of offense. Texas A&M at 133, but about half came on one play. Aggies get the ball to start the second half. They trail by 20. Here's Chris Fowler. And the Stolium Epoxy Shield presents ESPN's Labor Day weekend kickoff. And it's been pick up where you left off here in Salt Lake City. Rice Eccles Stadium was a buzz last year as Utah went 10 and 2 on the Mountain West and dive right back in leading 27 to 7 here as we get set to start the third quarter. Look at that yardage domination. And so much of Texas A&M's yardage, 93 of the 133 came on two plays. Rustolium Epoxy Shield halftime highlights, or halftime stats show you a lot of highlights for Utah after the catch with 170 yards. Jill Arrington down on the field, Mike Tirico, Lee Corso, Kirk Herbstreet. Tell us how we got here and then where we're going. I think Utah won this football game immediately when they established the line of scrimmage. They were running the football and protecting Alex Smith. I know Smith's lighting him up and he's doing a great job, but the offensive line is protecting him and they're running the football. They're winning it up front. Well, I think Texas A&M, their youth is showing. They, they've had a hard time adjusting to this complex scheme of not just Alex Smith and the offensive line, but the play calling, what Mike Sanford is trying to accomplish. Utah, you gotta remember guys, no preseason games, no scrimmages. Live bullets, ready, fire, aim, and Utah is very well prepared. Ryan Borison with the kickoff. It looks like we'll actually get a return here tonight by Jason Carter. And a good one. Oh, he was tripped up at the 43. A marker comes down 20 yards behind the play. And after the play was long gone, Sean Harper made the tackle. Two flags sitting back here at the 20. Never a good sign for the returning team with those kind of Holding players. return team, number 52, the 10 yard penalty, first down. Fred Woods, junior backup linebacker out of Houston. If you're just coming in, checking out what's happened thus far here tonight. Uh, despite an injury that we have not seen him since, what a great start it was for Steve Savoy. A touchdown catch of 78 yards, a run of nine. Alex Smith is accounted for three touchdowns and 258 yards. Meantime, Reggie McNeil, the quarterback, officially sacked twice, but put on his back uh, about seven or eight other times and unable to get any momentum going. It was McNeil's athleticism showing in a 59-yard touchdown run that was the longest play of the night and the only scoring play for the Aggies. So the flag came down to the 20, unless the drive should start 30 yards behind where the kickoff return ended up. Courtney Lewis, a little room to run finally for the running back who picks up about eight yards. Tommy Hackenbrook made the tackle. Coach Corso, give me your halftime adjustments. Okay, I've been behind 27 to 7 before. I have good experience in this way. If Texas AM then is going to win this ball game, they got established the run with McNeil and Lewis with the option play. Remember that nice drive they did? Boom. And on defense, forget that man for man. It ain't going to work. Keep everything in front of you inside. They got to win this game on defense. Keep them inside you and in front of them, please. Lee's Home Depot coaching adjustments. Pickup of nine, second and one. They throw and lose two. <clears throat> this was caught by Terrence Murphy. Steve Fafita and Marquez Ledbetter got out there to make the tackle. It's Fafita, 94, preseason all league at 311 pounds on the nose. 311 pounds. As nose guard, not exactly 311 yards. And they run well inside. I mean, they're big guys, but they flow to the football, and that time going back into the sideline, you got to wonder about the play call. Not as much room for their run <laughs> But uh, you gotta, you got to try to give your receivers some room. I know you want second one, run the ball, run Yeah, the ball. I want to get the ball away from the other guys. Third and two. Fake to Lewis, a keep for McNeil. The speed to get to the corner at a first down to the 33-yard line. Corey Dodge chased him down from the backside, but 
15 yards for the junior quarterback out of Lufkin, Texas. Well, they went back to that second down play that worked so well, the first down play that worked so well, where they had the counter. This time they faked the Lewis. The entire defense goes with the action. And again, going back to the athletic ability and Reggie McNeil, he's so comfortable on the corner, but that entire defense followed Lewis. He carried out that fake well. And Aggie's able to pick up a much needed first down here to start the second half. It's a big time uh, player coming out of high school. This was a huge recruiting get for Texas A&M when Reggie McNeil signed with the Aggies. Try it downfield. Good toss. Bad hands. Terrence Murphy dropped it. He was thinking about where he was going and forgot about where he was. What I liked about that call, that was an excellent call because it looked like the option play. McNeil comes down the line, and Kirk, he throws a perfect pass. The Murphy should have had that one. Took his eye off. Of Murphy it. looked up, and he's trying yep. to think about where he's gonna, where he's going to go and what kind of dance he's going to do. He's got to focus on the ball. Last year, Murphy dropped some passes. They talked about how he's improved in that area. The thing that Reggie McNeil did a nice job there, he had time to throw, and he showed, showed nice patience mm -hmm. and giving Murphy time to get across and into that open space. It's the second time Murphy's hey, had tonight? with a 25-30 yard game and put it on the road. Nice move by Lewis. Keep back to the hole and close quickly. We'll have third and about six coming up. Jill Arrington, what were they talking about down at halftime? Well, Coach Fran told his team, guys, this is the beginning of a journey, not the destiny. Just keep it simple. Take care of your assignments. Make your blocks. We're going to be okay. Now, he gave the team these little armbands. They're wearing them on their wrists, as you'll see on the team. He said, don't put this on unless you're going to play with one heart. That's what they need to do. He reiterated that at halftime. We're a team. Just take care of your assignments, and the game will take care of itself. Yeah, there's a calmness about Dennis, Jill, that uh, when we all met with him last yeah. night, he knows what's ahead. He knows this isn't going to be a 10 2 season. Uh, there's patience out of that man. He understands he's got a lot of young players. Nope. No zone blitz that time. McNeil going up top. Incomplete intended for Daquan Mobley. First time they've to throw Mobley's way, but Ryan Smith, a freshman out of Diamond Bar, California, stayed there in coverage, and AM will have to punch it away. These Texas AM receivers. No, that would have probably been a tough catch. But you got to go up and make the grab. You have to. High point the ball and make the catch. Jacob Young's been on TV a lot tonight. The punter's been busy. This is his eighth. A lot of people causing a lot of confusion up front. And AM got it all organized. Let's just get the ball out of there at this point. Fair catch called for and made on the fingertips by Paris Warren. Utah back on the field with Alex Smith. Pretty good first half. Alex, start the season. Alex Smith had a great 0-3 and he's picking up uh, where he left off. He's had time to throw. The scheme has been great. We're seeing a different style of offense. He's running, he's throwing, but they're getting the ball downfield because of the defensive style that AM has played. Give a lot of credit to the offensive line and to the skill around Alex Smith, but he is very controlled and very cerebral. 13 and 19, not a bad first half, 253 yards. We mentioned Steve Savoy was injured in the first half. He's back in there now to start this second half. A gain of about three on first half for Quinton Ganther. Ganther, there is Savoy back on the field. The sophomore with the first two touchdowns of this season for Utah. Ganther has excellent balance, ran for almost 1,500 yards in junior college last year. I thought it was interesting when Mike Sanford, the offensive coordinator, talked about Ganther. He said, the most serious junior college player that I've seen come into this program. They really were impressed with how ready he came to play at this level. Second and seven, it's option and the pitch. A couple of yards at the time. Jackson Appel tackling Paris Warren. Done so much with Warren moving him around. Johnny Jolly up there from the defensive front as well. What we've learned about Utah for people who are just tuning in watching this game is number one, Utah is a very good football team. And their offensive package, when you don't have game film to prepare that first or second game for, you don't want to schedule Utah as a non conference game because the system that they run, the athletes that they have, it's just so tough, especially for a young team like AM, to prepare for this kind of scheme. Need to get to the 40. Nice catch by Warren. Held 
eye marker down as Warren breaks the tackle and takes it out to the 44 yard line. Like Warren may have pushed off a Singleton okay. there and trying to get open. Ryan oh. Singleton, oh. defensive back. No. No. Off the hold. We just saw it the last second, but it, it, it's a good call because Singleton did lock in on him. This option round has killed Texas A&M the entire first half. It's <laughs> obvious he, he mugged him and held on to him. At, at the end there, it looked like uh, it looked like you saw a push off from the receiver, but Singleton did everything he could to try to hold on to Warren. And you know what the catch was? The catch was kind of what Paris Warren's summer workouts were like. Give me those balls off the Jugs machine, 100. I got tied up, turned around, boom, here's a ball like right at my face. And got up there and showed good hands that he worked on all summer to become a better receiver. Gain of 22, turn it to the ground, and Quinton Gather steps it out to the 41-yard line, a pickup of three. Panther out of uh, Richmond, California. A lot of Californians sprinkled in. They're good high school football here in Utah, so there's a recruiting base to start with. And the access to uh, Salt Lake City from a lot of the cities out west helped make this a very attractive school to come to. And Hawaii and Samoa. Yes. I mean, they got some good looking guys from that Samoa. 41, AM pressed up close to the line. Run this time by Marty Johnson. Three yard shot of the first down. Justin Warren came in on the tackle. You know, guys, we kind of watch this game. Let's go back to what we said at the very beginning. Utah plays Texas A&M. One team's ranked, one team's favored. Five years ago, you guarantee that's Texas A&M. Now it's Utah, and the reality of what Dennis Franchoni faces in turning around the Aggies in the Big 12 is that. Utah might have the better players right now, the better athletes compared to Texas A&M. And I don't think five years ago you would have dreamed of saying that could happen. Definitely the more experienced athletes. Mm -hmm. Third and four, Smith keeps and runs to the end zone. Touchdown. That's two right. running touchdowns to go with two tosses. Alex Smith's got a four touchdown night. He's still got a lot of football game left, too. Last extra point was missed. So, you know, Brian Borison, the punter who holds Kavakovich's work out here. Thirty-four seven. Utah. Touchdown runs of 7 and 37. Touchdown passes of 78 and 38. The guy was a graduate student, very ready to be back on campus and start his junior season. It was Utah Day. Uh, some city workers and county workers able to get a, a half day. Uh, away from work, come down and enjoy a party down here on the University of Utah uh, Rice Eccles Stadium on the foot of the campus, just uh, steps from downtown. And boy, it has been Utah Day that has now evolved into Utah Night. 34 to 7, complete domination of Texas A&M here. No return on the Brian Borison kickoff. A touchback. And here's the touchdown from a moment ago. Okay, Makai Alona, number 70 right here is going to pull, comes down the line and traps it, and then Smith goes up the middle. That's the old tackle trap play without a running back and a tackle, boom, traps it, Smith hits it, knows, see that man-for-man -man coverage, there's no free safety, and good night, sweethearts. The offensive line from Utah, in my opinion, has been the most valuable players in this ballgame, both blocking and pass protection and run block. Well, every, everything is clicked. When we talked with Mike Sanford, you could tell his eyes kind of lit up when he talked right. about his offensive line. He knew that he had a good group, and he knew that these guys could step in here against a talented A&M group, physically talented, and handle their own. 
a dozen plus first down yards for Jason Carter over a markers down a couple of yards beyond the line of scrimmage. It's one of those games where the Utah offensive line when they study film tomorrow or on Saturday everything is going to be a, a, a plus. There are going to be very few minuses when they look back at this because of the execu execution. Not only Alona coming around with a tackle trap but also Tupelo did a nice job of coming up and coming off his blocker and then sealing that linebacker and just basically giving a nice hole there for Alex Smith to run through. Alex Smith probably thought, this is easier than scout team. This is easier than practice. Holding offense, number nine, 10 yard penalty, repeat first down. Jaquan Mobley, the wide receiver, was flagged there. Well, we mentioned how horrible the end of the season was. I look at the numbers there. It's just progressively worse. And Kirk touched on it earlier. You know, we're talking about a program that uh, thought and believed that perhaps it hit rock bottom and started to turn around. You may look back and say they played a heck of a Utah team here tonight. Still a lot of time in this game. But I, I think people who were expecting AM to turn it around this year might be a little bit ahead of the curve. You know, this team has so many young, inexperienced players need to do some significant things, including getting that advantage back to Kyle Field. Courtney Lewis, room on the outside, takes it out of bounds. Four yards before the first down, a pick up for 16. Well, I think Dennis Franchoni and his staff are going to be fighting a couple things as this season progresses. Not only having that youth, not only having right now discrepancy as far as talent is concerned, but also trying to battle the mindset. He's trying to get this team to believe in his philosophies. Think about Urban Meyer. He comes in and he talks about his philosophies. They go 10 and 2. Guys, it works. See, we went 10 and 2. Dennis Franchoni tries to come in and talk about his philosophies. They go 4 and 8. Sometimes it takes a little bit of success to get everybody to pull together. A lot of that happens when you have success away from home. This crew didn't win a road game last year. Tydrick Riley Jr. was a high school quarterback. Tydrick takes it out for a first down at the 32. Well, Dennis Franchoni has uh, been given the moniker of a guy who rebuilds and turns around programs. And People often talk about the second year he's at a place, how it improves from the first year. Well, look at the way he leaves the project. Here's an idea of how good the teams became. Well, the Mets go to a nine-win team. The turnaround TCU that over on ESPN2 right now is still evident with Gary Patterson as the head coach, taking over a very fractured Alabama program and getting to 10 wins. McNeil trying to do it on his own at no And Corey Dodds has been everywhere tonight. Good play. 6 3, 225, Salt Lake City's Hillcrest High School League. Well, one more point before we leave Franchoni. I know this is an important play, but this is even more important. Dennis Franchoni's record, his second year in his career, has been 51 wins, seven, 19 losses. Second year at a place? Second year in his career. Mm -hmm. The second year of every one of his places, he's won 51 games and lost 19. That guy can coach, but I'll tell you one thing. He better recruit because he ain't got too many good football players. I don't think no. that's the way that play was made to be run. And I want to make this statement. I know it's early, but this is a perfect example to me of a halftime was done. This is a perfect example of the West Coast spread offense with guys that can't run it. The quarterback, Reggie McNeil, could practice all night, every day, 24 hours a day and not be able to run this offense effectively. He is a running option, tough athlete quarterback. He's not Alex Smith. I'm telling you, watch it the rest of the year. State champion in Lufkin, 5A, a very good football player. Came in through four touchdown passes to beat Oklahoma in his freshman year. Third down throw is caught, but 10 yards shy of the first down. Antonio Young, a reserve free safety, hit the type of Riley and will force another punt. Here he came out of high school. It was Vincent Young and Reggie McNeil. Vincent Young obviously went to Austin. Reggie McNeil went to College Station, and there was just as much hoopla about McNeil going to College Station at AM. And you know, that first that first year he didn't play a lot, but everybody remembers what he did against Bob Stoops and the Oklahoma Sooners. An Oklahoma team that was rolling 
heading to the national championship yep. game. Punt number nine on the night. You can see a little bit of what Paris Warren sees. Take a peek and make a fair catch. Pretty well there at the 33. Nice look from Skycam. Well, Utah rolling here tonight. Some people think they can roll all the way through this season. Be one of the non-BCS conferences to bust into the BCS. We'll talk about their other company in a minute. Sound good. Oh, you're polished. It's part of the whole it's hard part, of the, part of the night. Utah day, teams dominating, bands dominating. Well, the band had a good offseason. Well, yeah, they did. They had a very nice recruiting year, brought in some trombone players from the high schools around here. Nice two day job. Yeah, nice. We joke, you know, bands work hard in the offseason. Wow. I, I watched a band. Well, I shouldn't even say that. First down run. <laughs> I know one thing. I'll well, tell, you, for a couple I'll tell you one thing. Why? You can tell it's 34 to 7. Why? Breaking the band, the band Breaking the band down. We got the band down. We got to break down mascot heads. That'll be later oh, this we'll weekend. Oh, Saturday. It can't oh, kick in. Yeah. I wonder who's going to wear week oh, one. LSU, Oregon State's the game day game. Uh, what about BCS busters? Because Utah is not in one of the six big leagues that get the automatic contract in the BCS. There's so much talk about will a team from the Mountain West or Conference USA be able to make that on train to the BCS. After this play, I want you to tell okay. me who your team is. Right. And Kirk, your team too. Maybe bust into the one of the four big games at the end of the year. Johnson, another carry, a couple yards shy of the first down. Wait, okay, I got Memphis, Memphis Tigers. I got a guy named D'Angelo Williams, probably the best running back nobody's heard about. Joe Lee Dunn, the defensive coordinator, wonderful football coach. I like Memphis. They don't have your TCU. They don't play. They got nice. Louisville and Southern Mississippi at home. Watch out for the Tigers. Conference USA. Conference Tommy West, the first, first, coach, good first, friend there. First, besides so. the team in red. Yeah, I was just saying, what these guys? Besides the team in red, which is obvious, already in the top 20. I think, I think uh, TCU. Yeah. They made a run last year. They've got a lot of those guys back. Tough schedule this year. They've got to go to Louisville. They've got to go to Cincinnati. They've got to go to Texas Tech. But if uh, they could stay healthy, I think TCU has a chance to make another run. Third in the yard. They throw four and get the first down with Travis LaTondra. TCU opening in season against Northwestern on ESPN2. And Chris Fowler has an update on that game. Yes, and Michael and another team from the Lone Star State is faring a lot better than the Aggies. This is Ty Gunn. He'll find Michael DePriest over the middle. Splits the secondary guys. 82 yards later, it's 14-0. After a two-point conversion, the Cats have missed a pair of field goals. We'll keep you posted. All right, Chris, thank you. TCU on top of a couple of scores there. Northwestern, one of only uh, four teams really in the Big Ten returning a quarterback. A lot of quarterback changes in the Big Ten this year. Steve Savoy caught the touchdown pass, had another touchdown run. Joe Arrington told us earlier he left the game to be checked on medically. Picked up nine yards there. Looks okay. Well, of the non-BCS league teams, the best finish in terms of the rankings, the polls, go back to Tulane, their perfect season in 1998. Last year's Miami of Ohio team, led by Ben Roethlisberger, first-round pick of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Marshall, Bobby Pruitt, and that program rolling again in TCU with their run back in 2000. Dennis Franchoni was the coach there. And now Gary Patterson, who was his defensive coordinator, has taken that team over and kept it going down in Fort Worth. That Miami of Ohio team, I think, is another team worth keeping an eye on in the MAC. And I know they play in Ann Arbor against Michigan this weekend. Long ball for Justin Walker. Incomplete. Walker, a junior college transfer out of West LA Community College. Well, we've been ripping them enough. We might as well say something nice about Byron Jones, a senior from Bay City, Texas, number 11. That was nice coverage. He played with, he watched the receiver all the way downfield, and when the ball receiver looked for the football, he did. Now, that was one of the best defensive plays that they've had. Very few, but that was a good one by Byron Jones. Watch him as he goes down the field. See, he looks for the ball when the receiver looks for the ball, yeah. and he has a chance to knock it away. That was very good fundamental football, football by Jones, number 11. Third and a couple for Alex Smith in the Utah offense, which has rolled up 409 yards here tonight. Hey, miscue. <laughs> First one of the night for Utah. Marty Johnson, the running back, didn't get the clean exchange. Jason Jacks, Jason Jack, excuse me, 
made the tackle. It's uh, fourth down. They might go for yeah, yeah, but I want, I want Kirk to watch this play. Remember that option play you like so much? Look at this start running the option play with this Smith kid. Yeah. Did you see that no. guy come down that read option? Hey, babe, we're four minutes left to go in the third quarter, and that's the first miscue they've had. They've been running that play all night. Yeah, but that play, Kirk, they haven't pulled the ball out on that read you like. If they do that play in that offense, that Smith's going to be even better. Oh, yeah. Woo! That, that's kind of they, they, they just they don't need it yet. So it's almost like they're, they don't want to show up. But you're right. It's there's so many different ways they can attack you with the option. Different reads that Alex Smith will have and I tell you it's a tough offense to get ready for. Mm. Fourth and a couple Utah's going to kick it took the delay of game penalty. Take another five yards. So they will punt. When let's see. Uh, bring the uh, special teams unit out for Texas A&M. They have their punt safety and keep most of the defense out there with just a return man and now they'll kick it away Matt Kovacovic, a junior college transfer Palomar junior college he's a Southern California kid he's that formation we talked about yes, in the first sir. half he goes between the first two of the up backs and then they tighten up together in a little small pocket for the punter First time I ever saw that Syracuse do with Ben Schwartzwaller, 1963, when I was coaching in Maryland. He invented that punt formation. It's still, still using around. It. Still using back. It. National back. championship coach, 1959. Absolutely. Best defensive Dude. team I've ever seen. Right. ESPN's College Football Primetime. Brought to you by Jeep. Trail rated capability. Only in a Jeep 4x4. And Sonic. It's not just good, it's Sonic good. So nice to be back with you on Thursday nights. Be with you for the next 14 weeks. Next week on ESPN2, go see Missouri play Troy down in Alabama. See Brad Smith, one of the good quarterbacks. Start out here in Utah. We'll end up Thanksgiving night with West Virginia and Pittsburgh. Lee's a chic pick. All right. To uh, end up in the national championship game, Rich Rodriguez is Mountaineers. Utah leading 34 to 7. Reggie McNeil back to work. Turning off top to Terrence Murphy. Incomplete. Well, Nagahi with the coverage. 50 years senior at a Skyline High School here in Salt Lake City. Nice job of getting a hand in there just at the last second. Lee, you talked about technique and coverage. He's beat here. If the ball is thrown down the field, it's a big completion. Luckily, the ball's underthrown, and Nagahi had a presence of mind to turn and deflect the ball away. But he was beat by a couple, couple steps there. Nagahi is one of the best leaders they've had around here for a long time. He's elected captain unanimously. They like him because of the fact that he's a competitive guy that leads a team by example. He saw 10 full possessions. They had the one running play at the very end of the second quarter technically counts as a possession but you get the point they haven't done much tonight McNeil brings it out shy of the 30 we'll have third and three coming up ESPN's Labor Day weekend presented by Rustolium Epoxy Shield rolls on tomorrow Saturday and Sunday how about the Saturday double F Oregon State in Baton Rouge to see number three LSU with their share of the championship from last year College game day starts at 10.30 a.m. Eastern down there in Baton Rouge. And then Notre Dame and BYU from all 40 minutes or so south of here in Provo. Both games available, like tonight, high definition on ESPN HD. Your local cable operator, the folks at Direct TV or Dish Network got you dialed in if you want to find out more about ESPN HD. McNeil, good throw and a completion with room to run for Jason Carter down the sideline. Pushed out of bounds. At the 18-yard line, the field judge fell down, so it was hard to spot it. But a nice gain of 54 for the senior out of Caldwell, Texas. Uh, he's got one-on-one -on -one coverage here, and he's able to just break away. I mean, it, this is just relying on great athletic ability. And once he gets away from Oates, now he gets in the open field. We've been talking about the great athletic ability of Texas A&M Texas A&M's wide receivers. It's one of the first times we've had a chance to see him get out in the open field and make some make something happen. Well, they were all excited about Jaquan Mobley, number nine, junior college guy. We've seen Terrence Murphy's ability during the years, and Jason Carter showed a little bit there. 54-yard pass completion, and now McNeil able to keep it, and the first snap in the red zone all night. Gains only a yard as Spencer Toon, the fastest, fastest 
of the linebackers made the play. 4-5-40 for Spencer. He's a converted strong safety that Kyle Willingham told me that he's one of the best natural athletes he's had at linebacker since he's been here. Ten years Kyle Willingham has been here at Utah as a defensive coach. Terrific football coach. Tune, the middle linebacker Hackenbrook and uh, Corey Dodds. The coach described him as a salty bunch. <laughs> they run, they hit, they love to be a little bit nasty on the football field. There's completion inside the 10 to the 5. Murphy tripped up the 3 as Gerald Fletcher was hanging on to prevent the score. We're marking at the 4, but it's first and goal. That time, you've got to watch McNeil. He really rifles this ball to Murphy. And Murphy breaks the tackle and goes on to it. You'll say to me, now why are they doing it now so good? Well, the score is 34 to 7. And psychologically and emotionally, that Utah defense is not the same defense that started the first part of the game. But doesn't Texas AM need to play hard this Yeah, time? yeah. Hey, yeah, but let me tell you something. Realistically, sweetheart, that ain't the same defense out there with the same heart. First and goal with the lead back from Keith Joseph, Courtney Lewis, unable to get more than a yard. Steve Fafita, we had him make some big plays in the game we saw last year against Cal. Good nose guard made that play. My, my point is, yes, these guys need some positive. They need something to build up. Four and eight, 77, nothing, 34, 7. They need something to hang their hat on as they get ready uh, it's, for their next game against sure. Europe. Uh, Wyoming next Saturday and it's week one I mean, it, last year was last year they, they have a long way to go anything that they can build on for next their next game is vital at this point Jesse Woods bottom of the screen McNeil stumbles good athlete regains his composure to be hit by Morgan Scally flag down The Utah defense pride is coming back now that they feel threatened. a and made a few plays. They moved the ball inside the red zone. It's kind of woken the Utah Utes up. They don't want to give up another touchdown. And the crowd as well. Yep. <laughs> kind of fired up. Offense, number eight, 10-yard penalty. Repeat second down. That's Kerry Franks, a freshman wide receiver. And a couple of holding penalties downfield by receivers tonight. And I know the game's out of reach, but it's it's just a little things that you end up looking back at. And you wonder what happened to Texas A&M. Not only were they out executed, but it's little things, penalties at key moments that have hurt Dennis Franchoni's team tonight. Dropped all the entire game. Might have been the wrong number there. I don't necessarily know that Franks was on the field. So. It looked like 81, my man. Yeah. Joey Thomas, didn't he? I thought so. <laughs> I said a good thing about him one time, but he finally, did he finally get caught that time? You think? <laughs> <laughs> he held him high that time. <laughs> Can't hide it that way. Nothing to laugh about for Coach Frank tonight. McNeil pressured, incomplete. That rush right in your face. Uh, I've met a quarterback yet who enjoys that. Jason Carter had no chance because McNeil had no chance. And how about Fifida? I mean, is that guy tough or what? And this, I want to know one thing. They list him at six foot. And I promised him I would tell everybody he really is six foot. Now i am got my fingers crossed. There you go. Because I stood next to him. Yeah. And I'm a little bit taller than him. And You're I'm big. fine. Too. Big. But that guy's one of my favorite players because look at him. Man, is he a tough football player. He's a nose guard. That's a nose guard. <laughs> Third and goal. Caught short. Irvin Taylor, his brother Jamar, was a sixth round pick of the Giants. Caught nine balls last year. Stopped by Casey Evans, and it's fourth down. And the Aggies going to go. It's, big, it's, it's not big for this game. This is big for Texas a and I mean, I. It's just that, you know, if they get stopped here, imagine walking off the field as an offense. Game's already out of reach. You're building for next week and trying to build for this season. Oh, no, 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 that's wrong. They took a timeout. The clock was running. The quarter was going to end. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. You. That's a, it's just one of those things that you got to you got to understand that as a quarterback. The clock's running. Your quarter's going to run out. You don't need to take a timeout. Well, let me tell you something. He didn't take that timeout on his own, sweetheart. 
somebody from the sideline told him to take that time out. Did you see him? He was there way over no, the I'm far just side. Telling you. No, he was way over the far side over there. Right? He was in the huddle and spun out. Somebody, okay. I'll guarantee you one thing, he'd be chewed out forever for a quarterback taking a timeout without somebody telling him to take it. Let me just say this. Yeah. You want to break this up? We're starting brawling. I can tell you right now, you know it's 34 to 7 with 13 seconds to go in the third quarter. When we're breaking down who called, we're arguing who called the timeout. Was it the quarterback? No, I, I think I saw a GA. Wait I think a I saw a coach. That's, I mean, that's better than the band. How's, you guys were talking about the band. How are my TCU ago? Horn Frogs, my upset you team? You want to throw for the, the, Fowler for the update, Chris, guys? Chris Fowler, what do you have for us? How, how are the Horn Frogs looking? I'm going to come to the rescue here. Uh, Northwestern is responding to adversity. They marked 75 yards in 10 plays. That is Noah Heron wading into the end zone. Horn Frog still off early second on ESPN2, 14 to 7. And Boston College finally beginning to build a little bit of a lead at Ball State. It's now 19 11 as LB Whitworth, the freshman, has just gotten in the end zone. Still just an eight point lead. With a kickoff return in there as well. And as the guys alluded to at the back end of halftime, Ball State is not one of the teams considered in the elite. Teams in the MAC that are pulling Mid American Conference upsets. What do you call him? Are you going to have an option? Option play. Fourth and goal. Option play. With McNeil pitching to Courtney Lewis. Did he get there? No. Uh, Stop short. The Utah defense takes the cheers to the sidelines. This tells you about the Utah pride. This tells you the game's out of reach. Look at this defense. They made the stop. Nice job of running to the football, not giving up on the play. One of the better tailbacks they'll play against this year. Gang tackle. They got there just in time to stop it. And Tommy Hackenbrook, the middle linebacker, number 40, makes this play. Watch him come right here. He's the guy that stops him. He's a former running back. Good-looking athlete. Casey Evans also contained yep. him, nice. forced Lewis back to the inside. And Hackenbrook, when he sat down with these players, he said, he almost had tears in his eyes talking about how I want to prove to my teammates as a senior that I can be the guy in the middle of this defense. Very emotional player. 99 yards of field, last play of the quarter here. And Smith will just keep it to gain some space. You know, Hackenbrook was a running back. Yep. He, yep. he had to go over the defense because this new spread offense came in. They didn't have any need for a fullback. So it's up over the defense, middle linebacker, little mohawk going. That's, that's, that's a fresh cut, too. Yeah. Attitude, performance, success. Lost the expectations realized thus far tonight. Utah 27, off to the fourth. And off we go to the fourth quarter from the state capital of Utah. Here in Salt Lake City, Mike Tirico, Lee Corso, Kirk Herbstreet, Jill Arrington. Glad you're with us for college football primetime presented by Cooper Tires. Utah allowed a point in the quarter. That hadn't happened in the prior 10, but didn't happen again in the third. They lead 34 to 7. Alex Smith run up the middle. If you were just joining us, the quarterbacks had quite a night. Bryant Singleton able to bring him down. Smith has four touchdowns, two running, two passing. Probably not going to throw much, but he's got a shot at a 300-yard passing night. He's also run for 60 yards as well. And I think that's the, seven, me. that's the thing about Alex Smith that people don't really understand. Is that he, sure, he can throw, and he's a drop-back style quarterback, but because of his offense, defenses have to be accountable for him and his athletic ability. He can get you enough yards just to keep you honest as a defense. Kicking again. Huh? 33. Huh? You want to do some teaching? You ready? Yeah, that's the play I was telling them about. Yeah, well, this is the play we've been waiting for. And the, what's happened is the Texas A&M defensive ends have stayed upfield. What happens here? You can stop it. As soon as he gets to the mesh point with the running back, he's going to make a read here. If this guy comes down, as he does, commits to the running back, Alex Smith's eyes are on that man, and he simply keeps it, and he's going to take it up to the next level. It's option football. Read the defensive end. He comes down on the back, just like the wishbone. He's going to take it up. Without a pitch back, he's keeping that upfield and going to pick up another first down. Some of those old-fashioned run offense principles out of four wides. Quick time, Ganther. 40 
seven yard. And remember, this drive started inside the one. Now, and again, they can come at you in different ways. This time, he's going to, again, this time it's to the left. He's going to read this man. Is he going to come down or is he going to stay up? Alex Smith's eyes the entire time are right there. This time he stays wide. He hands it. Zone blocking on the play side. Big run for Utah. It's just a tough thing. One way or the other, this Utah offense is going to find a way to exploit you. Love that look from Sky Dan. That's pretty neat. Yeah, that's good sweet. I feel like I'm playing the video game. Especially with college football. I'm just, and, and I'm hearing you guys at the same time. So. <laughs> it's that triangle button right here. It's time to hand off to Marty Johnson. First down an update on Northwestern TCU again with Chris Fowler. Well, Mike, the Horned Frogs have answered Northwestern's answer, and Ty Gunn, who narrowly got the nod as starting quarterback over Brandon Hassel, making Patterson look very good. Second touchdown catch by Reggie Harrell, who equals his total from last year. Horned Frogs back up by a couple touchdowns in Fort Worth. You know, TCU is going to be heading out to this league in 2005. They'll be a member of the Mountain West Conference. The preseason pick out here. Other good teams in this league, though. It's not an easy walk, to say the least. Smith incomplete. Now, San Diego State has a lot of talent, although they have some injuries here in the early part of the season. I'll have to watch. I want to show you what Utah has ahead. Non conference at Arizona and at Utah State, traditional game. Utah State opens up with Alabama this week. And Air Force on ESPN Plus at New Mexico on ESPN 2. New Mexico got them last year. Carolina out of the league after an off week. UNLV, San Diego State, Colorado State at home. At Wyoming and BYU on the road. So four, or BYU at home, I should say. So four of the last five are at home. And teams that are pretty good in this league in San Diego State, Colorado State coming here back to back boots. Now, a question for you after third and three. High snap, good catch. Another good catch. Steve Savoy had it, yard shy of the first down. People out here, 10 and 2, haven't won a conference title in a half century almost. And Urban Meyer is having to deal with people saying, hey, you can go undefeated this year. And he's just saying, hey, wait a minute, let's, let's settle down. You see this team, you see their schedule. They have a chance to be very good and maybe get back to double digit wins this year. At New Mexico, tough place to play, good football team. Kind of no man's land here at the 37. Where you're not going to punt. Going for it on fourth and one. Hand off to Marty Johnson. And he's stopped. He's a couple of yards there. So Texas A&M's defense holds. And the Aggies will take over on down. We'll continue the Utah conversation. See what Kirk's think. Kirk thinks of the 4 use when we come back to Salt Lake City. It was 27-7 at half. Utah added a third quarter score, and they lead 34-7. Texas A&M, it gets no easier for them. Uh, they play Wyoming at home to open the season in Kyle Field in nine days, and then Clemson. Team starting the preseason polls. It's thrown by McNeil to Murphy. And Terrence Murphy takes it side of the 25 to the 23 so a big game there of 36 according to our stat man marty aronoff back with us here on our thursday night crew going to break we talked about utah can they be a team that could think about an undefeated season well first we all agree in college football you have to be lucky i mean you got to stay healthy as far as if they stay healthy i think they get colorado state at home they get byu at home two of the better teams in this conference that helps and at new mexico will be a challenge but if they can stay healthy, there's no question that Utah has a legitimate chance to run the table. But they have to have a little bit of luck along the way. They're not going to play like this every single week. A couple on the first down run as they go to the fullback, Keith Joseph. Once again, Jill Arrington. Well, guys, one of the things that I'm sure you can see from this game is Utah is playing like a team, and that is thanks to Urban Meyer. One of the things he implemented in trying to build his football program was called Team Testimonials. He asked players to get up in front of the team during two-a-days and tell them who they are as a person. If you look at this team, it's made up of all kinds of backgrounds. The players told me these testimonials, finding out where these guys came from, has helped them want to fight on the field for each other even more. It's the closest team they've ever had, and you can see it today. 
Swing out to Courtney Lewis. Jill with room to run. He's going to take it out of bounds at the 10 yard line. A little bit of what Jill was talking about the team building and building that really tight unit. You kind of saw in that fourth down play over here. 34 7, game's mostly over. But Fafita and the other defensive players there, and they fought to keep him off the uh, scoreboard again. You know, he got that idea from his former mentor, Lou Holtz. Lou Holtz has done that his entire career. Now, there's what his mentors are. And he, from Earl Bruce, he got discipline. From Sonny Lubeck, a regular guy. From Holtz, motivation. And Bob Davey, survival. He has those four pictures, and four pictures only in his office, those four guys. That's a great testimonial to those four people. McNeil keeping. Good athleticism to get to the corner and score a touchdown. So Reggie McNeil, who ran for four touchdowns last year, has run for both Texas A&M touchdowns here tonight. It seems like any time we're complimenting Reggie McNeil tonight, it's, of course, his athletic ability and, and his ability to create and find something out of nothing. That time, there's better execution, but, it, again, it just comes down to his feet, how quick he is, great in the open field, and he knows how to find the end zone. If I had Reggie McNeil as a quarterback, I'd make sure I work on everything I can to make him play like that, not throw the ball back there with all kinds of reach. That's my opinion. Isn't it a sign of a great coach? Not only having a system, but adjusting a system Absolutely. to your personnel. And you know what? Francione you will think do that. He's, it's exactly right. Yeah. He'll do that. Paperman's the extra point. 59 and 8. The two yardage distances on the touchdown runs tonight for Reggie McNeil. <laughs> after the Texas A&M score. Each team has added seven points here in the second half. And we'll see the Aggies kick it off one more time. Another chance to take a peek at the 12th man, John Ray. Cover the third kickoff of his career. Time, great tradition to the sport. E. King Gill, the original 12th man, 1922, came out of the press box for an injured player, put on a uniform, stood ready to enter, but he was never called on. And the student body, as so many of you know, stands throughout the game to respect the loyalty. And they stood and applauded and cheered and were behind their team through all of last year's tough games. And of course, give a chance to cover a kick. That's a touchback. That's no fun. Pull the legs up. Loosened up a little bit. Maybe you'll get another chance. Kick the rust off, huh? Well, one thing good about them, they placed him way outside. Just Oops. thought I'd mention it. Labor Day weekend presented by Rustolium Epoxy Shield continues all weekend Saturday now on ESPN. Oregon State at LSU. And then at 9.15, Tyrone Willingham. So much preseason talk, as always, about Notre Dame. They'll be in Provo to take on BYU. For more, log on to ESPN.com. And there you see the uh, Aggie fans reminding you of the 12th man faith long remembered. Smith still in the game, hands to Marty Johnson. On first down. Speaking of that LSU game where we'll be going to watch, let me tell you something. They've got a good quarterback in Matt Anderson, but let me show you one guy that Urban Meyer said to us that the one of the most important, if not the most important person on his staff, is Matt Bayless, the strength coach. He says it's his first year. He was an assistant last year. He came to the University of Houston. He said, this guy has done more for my football team and getting them ready in the offseason than anybody else. What a great compliment that was. Second and six here. Smith keeping this time in the game. A couple of yards, Kirk. You know, Lee, I, I think if we took a poll among Division I college coaches, every one of them would agree with what Urban Meyer's assessment is of his strength coach. What's happened with the restrictions from the NCAA? Head coaches, coordinators, assistant coaches, they can't be around these players as much. The one guy who can be around them is a strength coach. In the summer. In the, in the summer, you have a lot exactly. of but, but he, he establishes the work ethic. He's there to kind of, for, for moral support. Yeah, he's, he, he wears so many different hats, but most especially, he defines the toughness and establishes the toughness on football teams, and he's doing a great job here at Utah. Third and four pass complete to Steve Savoy. 
for the first down. Aaron Jones made the tackle. And I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but the summer part of that is important because college football coaches just don't have the time around the kids. They were supposed to be responsible for them, but they're not around them at that key stretch when they have so much time in their hands. As a former football coach, let me tell you the three positions you want to control. The strength coach, the trainer, who's always around them, and the equipment man, who everybody loves. You get those three guys in your football team around, and they and loyal to you, you get yourself a good team. Mark my words. In the 33, first down. Smith's still in there. Feeling close to 300 passing yards as he completes that one to Paris Warren. Out to the 40-yard line. No, it's, I saw I saw Tom Izzo, the great Michigan State basketball coach, uh, in the airport a couple of days ago, and he was going out to Kansas City for some meetings. One thing uh, Dr. Miles Brand, now the head of the NCA for the last couple of years, has uh, done is listen and really solicit the input of the college basketball coaches, the NABC, and say, guys, what do we need to do to help strengthen the game? And I, I hope this will happen with uh, the College Football Coaches Association and do the same thing because. Yeah, there are restrictions that the NCAA has for obvious reasons, but I think listening to the people who make the sport go, it gets some input into what needs to be changed and addressed in the game, and that might be one of the issues. If you're going to be responsible as a coach for how the kids act in the offseason, it's hard to be responsible for them when you're not allowed to be around them and talk to them. Seems like every day you, you pick up the paper in the summer, there's a player getting into trouble. Yep. Coach, the head coach isn't around. The strength coach is the guy that's there. Yet we look to the head coach for guidance. We look to the head coach, his fans, and in the media to be able to control his team. And I, you know, that's that's something that you hope the NCAA will look into and, and help these coaches out, help them to be able to police their, their teams a little bit better. First and ten. Smith is 299 passing yards unofficially. Still throwing here up 20. And he's over 300 yards. And Paris Warren's off to the races. Dancing and prancing. Picking up blocks. And first and goal at the end. That's 48 yards. Penalty flags at the end of the play. What's happening here is that because you have to account for the quarterback, let's get the call here. Dead ball. Unsportsmanlike conduct on the offense, number 15, 15 yard penalty, first and 10. 15 is Darrell Poston, a junior running back, transfer out of USC. I don't know if pick that number also. Because of Utah's scheme and how much they run Alex Smith, AM has to take chances, crowd the line, and put people up the line of scrimmage. It leaves themselves vulnerable in one-on-one -on -one opportunities on the backside. And anytime Alex Smith sees one-on-one -on -one with Paris Warren, he's gonna go right to it. And that time it was against number 40, Kevin Mangum. But did you see the offensive line pick up that ball? Oh, they nicely pulled around the guard. Combo up A up two. You got that one boy. Number 68. You got that one? I tell you, he got it. Yeah. I wish you could see it again. You'll watch it. It was a beautiful block by him. You got it? You got it. Let me see if Chris Fowler has it. Watch Chris. It. Oh, fellas. Uh, Utah's offense is looking pretty good, but so is TCU tonight at home against Northwestern. Lante Hobbs, 27 yard scamper just when the Cats had got it within seven. It's back up to 14. We will keep you posted. Thank you, sir. This lead, Kurt. Jill will join him. College game day down Baton Rouge. Different look here. This is the backup, Fano Tango Viola. <laughs> and he picks up the first down. Tango Viola is, uh, Viola, excuse me, is in there just for a changeup. Junior out of American Samoa. All right, watch my man here, Chris. Kamoa Atu. Number 68. Watch him come around here and pick up the blitz. Now you know why this guy is completing the pass at Smith. Watch this guy right here pick up the blitz. Well coached and really good looking football player. I love that offensive line from Utah. I love it. First and 10. Smith is back. Another touchdown. Beautiful catch by Jerome Wright, the senior out of Palmdale, California.
Well, if there were any freshmen in the band who didn't know the school fight song, <laughs> they learned it here tonight. Who does Utah play next? I think it's Mark Stoops probably sitting up watching this one, and Mike Stoops, Arizona. You, you can't focus just on Paris Warren. Alex Smith has an arsenal. He can spread the ball all over the field as he's been able to do tonight, and that time he hits Jerome right for the touchdown. By the way, perfect throw. How about that pass protection? Here they are getting it done. Look at that big guy. Game way out, too. Get after it. ESPN's College Football Primetime is presented by Cooper Tires Ultimate Bowl Tour. Go to a Cooper dealer near you or visit ultimatebowltour.com to enter. And Rust-Oleum Epoxy Shield for the ultimate garage floor. Jerome Wright's touchdown made it 41-14. We told you about the Texas A&M tradition to the 12th man. Well, Urban Meyer admires it and admittedly says we're trying to do something like that here at Utah and call him the Utah man. So, Billy Kinsey out of Morgan, Utah. Sophomore, walk on, same deal. Cover and kicks. And covering that squib kick was picked up by the tight end, Joey Thomas. Got into the mix there a little bit, not in on the big hit. It was Kinsey covering a kick tonight. Give me that ISO of Kinsey. Let's watch it. I think he might actually get a little contact here. The first of one of our isolations. There he got hit. He got hit. He got contact. Right. I was going to say, he got, he got he's got in there. there. He's showing some heart. Is it Billy? With that body in there. It's a good he, idea. And Urban said, no, just that's a real admiration, too, for what AM has done with that 12th uh, man situation. It's a little, gets a little physical on that kickoff coverage. You got to be ready. Head on the swivel. Reggie McBeal ran it in the last play. Nice throw. Beautiful. Nice oh, throw. catch there. Woo. Terrence Murphy brings it in across midfield. A pickup of 22. It's been a much better half for McNeil. Again, the Utah defense not in that pit of tears back mode as well. You know, September 7th is ESPN's 25th anniversary. Also, a special day for us is we start Show Your Spirit Day, and your company can do this. Help support the V Foundation, Jim Valvano's dream to fight cancer research. Get your workplace organized. Five bucks a person, and then you can wear your favorite team's apparel to work. You can wear a Utah hat, Aggie hat. Boss says it's okay. Get your office involved. Go ask the boss. Tell him the money goes to cancer research. Jim Valvano's dream to find a cure for cancer. McNeil's pass there is incomplete. So jimmyv.org uh, it is, is the uh, website. Go out and check it out and see if you can find some information. Get your office organized for that on September 7th, next Tuesday when ESPN turns 25. And hopefully it will continue for many years to come. Looks like these folks showing spirit all day and night here. You know, guys, we will obviously, you guys will be on game day. We won't be on before next Tuesday. And Kirk's been here. How many years have you been at ESPN now? Tenth year. Tenth year, coach? Seventeen. Seventeen. I'm 13. And, uh, you know, a thank you not only to all the people who've been a part of these 25 years. As McNeil throws here. Nice catch. Oh, Brant to carry Frank. Stump drop. The freshman didn't bring it in. All the people behind the scenes, production assistants, technicians, engineers, all the people who for 24 years and 360 days made those 5 a.m. flights out of small places to help us bring fans great games at home. Our faces and voices are on this network, but those are the people who are the lifeblood of this place. And that's, that's thank you to all of you folks for uh, making this 25 years so special. Those people are the Utah offensive line of ESPN that's for right. 25 years. Well, easier to pronounce than Kami Atu. Yes, yes. And I don't know. No question. <laughs> Dancing there by Jason Carter, who ends up at the 41-yard line. Eric Pettick and Jesse Boone. Those are my two guys. The center and the left guard need a little loving also. Hit those guys now. I'm... Talked about Utah and the uh, Samoan players, Lee, and oh, yeah. going to Hawaii yeah. game players. Morgan Scally is... He went to high school a mile from the stadium. Six tackles and a sack tonight. He's our Applebee's hometown hero. Preseason first team. All Mountain West Conference. Pass broken up. 
in the secondary by his DB buddy Ryan Smith, the freshman cornerback. So the fourth down will spin it back to Utah on downs. And Scally, captain and an academic All-American, comes to the sideline. His work probably done for the night. Utah ball. Remember, Sports Center comes up as soon as we're done in Salt Lake City. Now, maybe it's happening for you this weekend or five years ago or 20 years ago today. On campus for the first time, you know, the best years of your life, college. And we're back on campus with some of the best uh, Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays of the year, college football here on ESPN. What a show by Utah tonight, leading 41-14. Alex Smith is out. Ryan Johnson, the freshman quarterback, it's his first college football snap there. He is 17 years old, turned 17 in February. I want to remind you that Sports Center, just like this game, available on ESPN HD in high definition, is coming up next. The student body, not one of them is left. 41 14. They want to sing the they want to sing the song at the end of the game. You heard it chatting? Yeah, Urban, Urban Meyer. Meyer. Urban Love Meyer. It. Wow. Free game warm-ups. He's showing them his love. He's going down the whole front row. That is Johnson's first collegiate completion. It is Jerome Wright with the reception. 41-14. The starting quarterback's out. Safe at this point, guys, to make him the Wrangler player of the game? Uh, yeah, I think so. He counted for 563 uh, total yards tonight. Not himself, but he led this offense to 563 total yards. Five touchdowns. Ran for two and threw for three. Not a bad start to the 2004 season for Alex Smith. Brian Johnson, a high school quarterback at a Robert E. Lee. Good football play in high school in Baytown, Texas. Getting his first experience now. And Darrell Poston with the run there. Johnson is in as Smith's night is done. Well, he has shown his ability to do everything. He is, we've talked about his cerebral approach. This year what's happened is he has a better supporting cast. Not only does he have the great knowledge and now with confidence after last year, but what's happened is the guys around him have gotten much more athletic. It's a deeper team. He reaped the benefits of that tonight. He's uh, He's going to be an eye to keep, a guy to keep an eye on throughout the entire season. Alex Smith didn't start the first two games, if not for the injury to Brett Elliott in the uh, Texas A&M game on the final play, going for two, trying to tie the game. Who knows when Alex Smith would have seen the field? Hand off there to Ganther. Not much. Alex Smith is a great example, though, of quarterbacks that make a commitment to studying tapes. Not just saying, yeah, I'm studying the tapes, but literally every open opportunity he has in the day, he's over at the football office studying tapes on his own, not because the coach told him. As we said in the pregame show, he's 21 years old. He's a graduate already. Remember also, he was number two in the nation when the ratio of touchdown passes interception last year. Great year last year. Sante gave him an outstanding compliment, and they said he prepares so well that when we get to the game, there isn't a look that he hasn't seen. He knows how to adjust to every look. Johnson deep ball, incomplete. Now, if you're sitting home saying it's 41-14, what are they doing throwing the ball? Here's why, and I think coaches understand this. Brian Johnson is a freshman. He was in high school a few months ago. He has never played in a college game. Alex Smith is one snap away from a Utah team with all these big dreams of having a quarterback who's never played. So that's why they're throwing the ball. It may not feel good. A&M fans might be angry about it. But if the shoe was reversed with A&M's inexperienced backup quarterback, you could understand them being in there throwing the ball. Right, Coach? Or wrong? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, you didn't hear me yelling no, no, well, I always check that with you because oh, yeah. you're the person who's lived through it, and, yeah. it, you know, you understand it far I better than any of us. right on target. Right on target, Mike. Right? That little rugby punt. There you go. That's down from Fort Collins, right? <laughs> well, Sonny Lubick, Lee told us before, it's one of his uh, idols. It's his favorite. It is he got that from Sonny Lubick. He got something Ugliest from Holtz. He got something from Earl Bruce. By the way, look at these coaches on the rise we're talking about. Let me talk a little bit about Urban Meyer. You know, Urban signed a new six-year contract in May. They're smart. If he has a winning season, they add another year to him. So put it this way. If he continues to win, he will always have a six-year contract here at Utah. That was a nice move. Win-win for Utah and 
Urban Meyer. Around the country, his name is going to be at the top of the list when you get to November and December when coaches start to be asked to step down. Urban Meyer is going to be the hot name. There's interesting response he had, and we threw that out there to him yesterday. New quarterback, Ty Brandon. His pass is complete to the 32-yard line to Jesse Woods. Brandy, a sophomore out of Austin, Texas. Once again, Jill Arrington. Well, guys, I've been very impressed with the facilities here at Utah, and they only continue to get better. Coach Meyer, he said in his contract that he wanted a new practice facility. What he wants, he gets. It's right across the street. It's beautiful. You guys saw it. They started on it in June 14th, and they hope to get it finished by November. Former Utah All-American skier Spence Eccles issued a $2 million donation to jumpstart that $6 million project. It's a 75,000 square foot facility with a regulation size field, field turf, just like in here at the stadium, a 60 feet height for kicking drills, and fully heated in the winter. And that's what the players told me they were most excited about. They don't have to practice outside in the cold anymore. But they want to get that thing finished by November because they want to be able to practice in there for that BYU game. You know, after being here a couple of times, I think this place is everything to be a top 10 program. I've said it before. And don't be surprised. I'm telling you in advance, don't be surprised. The day the Pac-10 decides to go to 12 football teams so they can have a championship game that the number one team that they don't take, in my mind, would be Utah. Utah would be a perfect step to the Pac-10. And you know the other team I take? I take Colorado. I take Colorado and Utah, and I put them in the Pac-10, and then I play a championship game. I know. Will that, I know. Be, the, will that be the day before or the day after the Big Ten adds a 12 team? Well, I don't know, but I don't know about <laughs> there's, a, there's already a lot of talk behind the scenes about Utah and the Pac-10, and you're right, it's, it's a natural fit. It'd be a great what Urban Meyer's doing right now. We, I, I talked about it. I said, Urban, you're going to be talked about some big jobs out there. He said, Why would I want to leave Utah? And he's not just saying that; he really believes it because of the facilities, because of the conference they're competing in right now, what they're doing for the future. Utah's got a really good thing going right now, and it's going to take something special for anybody to even think about luring Urban Meyer away. Nice run there by Ty Brannion. You saw he grew up a Longhorn fan, grew up in Austin. There's a backup quarterback question here as well, as we remind you that SportsCenter comes up next. Who, if anyone, will run the table in college football? NFL preseason should have we had 10 this uh, Thursday night, and Ichiro, who has been unbelievable. He had what, 56 or 58 hits in the month of August. Uh, goes batty in Toronto. We'll see what he did in Sky. No, 56 hits he had in the month of August. Sports Center coming up in a little bit. Swing out for Chris Alexander. That's a uh, running back who they have high hopes for. And one of the many redshirt freshmen on Dennis Franchoni's team. When Texas A&M brought in some good talent last year in this, with the struggles in 2003, there was the obvious inclination to go play some of these true freshmen. Why redshirt them? But they did redshirt the most the majority of that class. And uh, players like Alexander, some of the defensive linemen we showed you earlier, they'll be the future this, uh, this program built upon. To the pass catch, second one of this drive for Quinn in Germany. Or told you ESPN HD tonight, and on through uh, the college football season with us on Thursdays, Saturday nights, and prime time. Of course, our NFL on Sunday. And some more games here on this big opening weekend Central Florida at Wisconsin, Oregon State at LSU, Notre Dame BYU will have three games all on ESPN HD. And while we have a second to mention in Central Florida, our uh, condolences to George O'Leary. He lost his mother. Yep. And George and I were together at a banquet on Tuesday night. He lost his mother just recently. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, George will not coach his uh, first game as the Central Florida head coach. Here is Chris Alexander taking it down to the four yard line on that swing out pass. Guys, uh, give us your thoughts here on the night. Texas A&M as they go back home and get ready for Wyoming in nine days and then Clemson and Kansas State back to back after that. Utah is as good as advertised. Texas A&M, Denver Fr Francione, those guys are going to have to do a really good coaching job to have a winning record from what I have seen in the teams they've had. Remember, he's 51-19 and 19 in his second year of every place he's been. He knows what to do. He's the seventh-ranked 
active coach in America for total wins percentages. He's a guy's a football coach. He doesn't have a lot of players. His system works. He's going to need time to bring in yep. personnel. All this talk about improved speed tonight. It's just one game. We didn't see the speed on either side of the ball. They didn't execute well on either side of the ball. A lot of youth on this team. They've got a long way to go when you look at their remaining schedule and getting through the brutal conference that they play in. On the other hand, Utah, Lee, you said they're as good as advertised. I think I think we all agree they're <laughs> looking at them after tonight. They're even better. When Urban Meyer steps on the sideline before the opening kickoff and tells Joe Arrington, this is maybe the biggest game in school history and they go out and win 41 to 14 I think that tells you about uh, where you thought Utah football's headed this year you, you've known Urban for a while as a Midwest guy he was uptight before this game every coach is uptight before the first game but he was really uptight about what, what they had coming in here he was wound up because he thought a and was coming in with a chip on their shoulder after last year and he didn't know how you never know when you break camp how good you could be because you've only been scrimmaging against each other the fake to Alexander, Brannion keeps it, he stopped at the five, Franchoni will take another timeout, and if you're wondering why, it's the same reason that Utah was throwing the ball there, because you have a backup quarterback with no experience, either Brannion or Stephen McGee, a uh, true freshman who, uh, or a freshman I should say, who really came in as one of the top prep quarterbacks in the country and was a pretty solid performer during those days and pushed Brandon for the backup job. Urban Meyer did a nice character thing recently that not many people know about. He brought Earl Bruce over, and Earl spent three days evaluating this entire program from coaching, from strength, and everything else. He learned so much from Earl Bruce on discipline. He brought him over here, Kirk. This is what I like about the guy. He brought his old mentor over, brought him into this situation, and learned again from him. I'll tell you what, that, to me, that's impressive stuff. Yeah, and he just wanted to get yeah. feedback. Hey, yeah. tell me, don't tell Earl me what I want to hear. Tell me, tell me what you think. He was a GA for Earl Bruce at Ohio State, and he's done such a great job moving through up, kind of up through the ranks and, and paying his dues to finally get a chance to become a head coach at BG, and and now here at Utah, and you can see how happy and how relieved he is after what this uh, this team has done tonight. A couple of those guys out there with Mohawks, uh, defensive coordinator Whittingham, Kyle said. If the entire defense gets a Mohawk, I will. And then Urban will be after that. Well, not everybody has, but the four or five guys do. Here's Brandon's throw. It's incomplete. And we'll have third down coming up. Remember game tomorrow night? Another uh, in a streak of important games for the Mountain West Conference. Everybody's always watching to see how the Mountain West does when they play one of the, quote, BCS leagues. And Utah has taken care of its business. Notre Dame, BYU will uh, lock horns on Saturday. We have Mexico tomorrow night in action here on the ESPN Family Networks as this great weekend starts taking on Washington State, Colorado State, Colorado. So important games for these Mountain West teams. I know it's the first week of the season, but these are their chances to prove up against the BCS leagues and earn their respect. Because the league is a very good one. Brandon's throw incomplete. We'll have fourth down coming up. We'll see you next week from Alabama. We'll see Brad Smith in Missouri. Another Big 12 team. One of those Big 12 teams trying to put it together to make a run and try to bang heads with Oklahoma and Texas, those behemoths of the conference. Don't forget, Troy State beat Marshall last year. They got set. There we go. Marshall beat Kansas State last year. Brandon quickly to Carter. Touchdown. So 41 to 20. Chad Schroeder made the block. Ty Brandon throws the first touchdown pass of his collegiate career. And one more extra point, one more kickoff, and we'll be off to Sports Center. Get you caught up on a busy night. Busy night in college football. Saw Boston College there really being pushed by Ball State into the fourth quarter. I know there are a lot of games on ESPN over this holiday weekend. I think you're going to be hard pressed to find a team to open the season and to execute as well as Utah has done tonight in every facet offense, defense, and special teams. Okay, we're to the point 41 21. Back to wrap it up and send you to the Sports Center right after this. Uh -huh. 
bad news to the Ty Brannion family. That was not Ty's first college touchdown. It was a backward pass. Thus, it is considered a run, not a pass. It is not a touchdown pass, but a run instead. Come on. I know, but yeah, the rules are the rules. 41-21. <laughs> Kick off here and send you off to Sports Center. And Northwestern TCU is over on ESPN2 as well. You'll be a chance to enjoy some more college football as the night goes on. Nice kick off the turn. Taken out of bounds. Ooh, watch out. This guy with a injury already was hit down there on the sideline. That's, that would really be a tough year. It's okay, thank goodness. That's, uh, that's Weddle, isn't it? That's yes. Eric Weddle, who yeah. was hurt the starting strong safety there in the uh, first half. Let's see Eric hopped up. <laughs> He's okay. Guys, safe travels to Baton Rouge. College game day, 10.30 a.m. Eastern. First on the road show. Right. Red, Start the season. The old red eye trick. Red Jill, Jill, Jill will be with you guys all she year. Will. Jill Arrington. But she's not taking a red eye. She's learned. <laughs> she's smart. She's smart. <laughs> smarter than you and I. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, the, the three of us bone heads. You're, you're heading to Ann Arbor, right? That's right. It'll be an interesting game. Miami of Ohio and Michigan will start the uh, ABC college football coverage. Tell me what you think of Josh Betts. The replacement for Ben Roethlisberger. Anxious to see what he'll do against that electrifying Wolverine defense. Angle Viola takes the last snap, and Utah continues its success from 2003. Final score: Utah 41, Texas A&M 21. Sports Center's coming up next, and we're moving over to ESPN News for our post-game extra. Early Corso, Kirk Herb Street, Jill Arrington, Mike Tirico. Thank you for watching this presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Good night from Salt Lake City, and off we go to Sports Center.